Hey guys, this is Eric Young, and you're listening to Book in the Territory. Hey, this is Ring of Honor Superstar Donovan Dijak, and you're listening to Booking the Territory Pro Wrestling Podcast. This is a one-man gang. You're listening to Booking the Territory Pro Wrestling Podcast. This is Booking the Territory, a pro wrestling podcast hosted by Mike Mills, Heart Body Harper from Wildcat Sports and Entertainment, and the mentally irregular Doc Turner. This podcast is a mix of your topics and thoughts in the world of pro wrestling, along with interviews and discussions with current independent stars and your favorite stars from the past. And now, here's your host, Mike Mills. Welcome back, everyone, for this week's episode of Book in the Territory Pro Wrestling Podcast. We are the pro wrestling podcast where pro wrestling's past meets pro wrestling's present. This week, I've got part two with former Smoky Mountain Wrestling heavyweight champion Bobby Blaze. And then this week's top five discussion is the top five Ric Flair feuds and opponents with emphasis being on how we actually rank them. Uh, as far as one through fives, I'm uh, one through five. I'm quite sure Harper and Doc and I will have some of the same five, but I'm curious to see how we rank the five with those feuds. So we will see how that goes. We've also got a few listener emails and a bunch of Twitter shout outs because the Twitter folks were pretty damn active within the last week. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll get to that uh, as we jump into things. But before we get into our interview you know how it is we got a ton of things to discuss we got some classic stuff we got some current stuff although not too much but before i do that all that said doc man what's going on how you doing this how you doing this week man you all right mike oh jesus what i'm listening i never expected you to take me seriously when i told you that we were going to set the smoky mountains on fire (laughs) that's not a joke I know. I know. What did you do? Uh, I, I, I didn't do anything. You weren't uh, people. He, you were at work. You weren't at work for a couple of days, and the next thing I know, I see on the news is why the Smoky Mountains are up. Why, why it's are you no joke. joke. The whole town is gone. At well, Gatlinburg. <laughs> when when I said we're kill, you're going to kill the town. I didn't know you meant it literally. No, no. That's nice. That's real nice. That's classy, yeah. here, Doc. Hey, it, but Doc, seriously, you want to tell the good people out there we're thinking of them and and all that good stuff, man? Because uh, I've seen enough tweets from the fans of ours in the Smoky Mountains that uh, have had a rough uh, rough week, man. Yes, I just hope that you've uh, put out the fire that's uh, right around your house long enough to download this podcast, and we hope you're doing all right. You're a fucking asshole. You know that? (laughs) It's a fucking asshole. And while we're at it, if they're in the fire on your property, we need those five-star reviews. Well, no, while you're at it, let me tell you this. He's playing He's playing podcast heel, everyone, because he, he, he really believes. He comes into my office and goes, I'm going to get this over this week. I'm like, dude, that's so lame. Do not say it. And he really believes that that, that was like a good promo. So, yes, Doc, it wasn't. Harper, how are you doing? I'm doing all right, bro. Sitting here. Fucking uh, digging through some uh, DVDs. I bought a Goodwill today. Uh oh, <laughs> he did. He's got a collection up on his mantle yeah. right now. I saw it on Facebook. I got, <laughs> I got uh, Days and Confused. I got fucking Ernest goes to camp. <laughs> I got Drive, and I got uh, Aqua Teen uh, Hunger Force. That's real nice, Hopper. Yeah, that's. I, saw, real I was good. fucking nervous because the can. I was like, "Holy shit! I haven't seen this since I was, you know, a kid." <laughs> he popped on Ernest goes to camp. Boy, I tell you, the shit wrestlers get excited about. <laughs> <laughs> Everything but wrestling these days, right? Yeah. It's a damn shame. Okay, everybody, let's get into things. Um, I do need a shout out. I got a bunch of shout outs towards the end of the show before we throw it over to Bobby, Bobby Blaze. But I do want to shout out Mullen of Morton and Armando Martino, Martinez at Monzi805 on Twitter. Man, so, Doc, did you see Mullen of Morton earlier today? He posted that bullshit where we're number that bullshit where we're number four. Yeah, Morton, you want to get stretched. Keep us at four. We need to be up at least one or two. Bro, shut up. We're in the top two. He every said time. his top four podcasts were the 605, 
mm-hmm. Jim Cornette, Bruce mm-hmm. Pritchard show, mm-hmm. and then us. Well, hold what on. What the fuck? Dude, we're behind. That's bullshit. We're behind two podcasts that do hundreds of thousands of downloads a week. I'm not ashamed by that. Out Bruce of all Pritchard, this shit this guy tags me in on fucking Twitter, he can't put us at one. Thank you. <laughs> Well, hold on. Harper, Harper, Harper here's what's going to happen. I'm going to get in my car. I'm going to drive down to New Orleans and scoop you up, and we're going to drive to East Tennessee and put out the fires, and when we're done, we're going to go kick Mulder Morton's ass. Let's okay. do this. Let's do it. Well, well, Monzi805 said, nah, 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 nah. Uh, BTT is better than Bruce Pritchard. So he's got That's a- true. Yeah, so he's got us. He's got us in the third slot. But Monzi said it's real close. He's like, man, he's that like Vader, that Vader. That Vader episode was that Vader episode. We should we're ahead of that easy. Yeah, the Vader episode was kind of boring. But I, I mean, I can't knock Pritchard's show, man. I, I do. I do enjoy it. But anyway, Mother Morton, we appreciate it, dude. If those are your top, listen, th- he said that's his four favorite podcasts. So okay, you, you know gotta, what? You know what? what you got to remember what? is we beat Austin. We so, beat Jr. So. We beat Colt. There's a lot of people we beat based on his favorite podcast. You know what we need to do? We need to go back to that best tag teams of all time so I can slide the rock and roll back down to number four. Oh, don't get me started on that because my <laughs> friends up in the, the, the wrestling podcast about nothing. Brian Malonis was on his – they're on their show this week, and they're fucking bashing the Rock and Roll Express because they're these Vince McMahon lovers up from the Northeast. Hey, Mike Crockett. Right. Hey, Brian Malonis. Well, I mean, Brian Malonis is intelligent, great professional wrestler. You know, he he's in in he actually worked at uh he he's done some extra work for WWE and ROH and man, he's like the rock and roll wouldn't be in his top five. I'm like, dude, what are you of, smoking? Of, of tag teams? Yeah. Hmm. Now now, truth be told, I think he's fucking with me, but whatever. Whatever. You are you are a mark and easy to work, so it's possible. <laughs> no, motherfucker, you're the easy one to work. I got to give credit to a couple to one person at Old Wrestling Pick on Twitter. I'll give them credit for this week's top five Ric Flair feuds and opponents because this was a poll that they had put up a while back, a few weeks back. So again, got to give them a plug at Old Wrestling Pick. Thank you for the idea. Thank you for always tweeting our episodes. We really appreciate it. So uh, we got this one from you, and we ran with it. Also, hey, hey Mike, I got yo. something real quick. Yo, yo, yo. Okay, come. How great? How great was Bobby Blaze last week? Bobby Blaze is awesome. He's a great interview. That was that was really good. You know, I I, I usually don't like I said last week. I usually don't listen to the parts of the show that I'm not on. But I made a I made a point to listen last week, and I'm really glad I did. And I'm looking forward to the, the, for us to shut up so that we can get to the Bobby Blaze part two. You're a lion sack of shit. You listen to yourself every week because you're a fucking mark for yourself. <laughs> if you were me, you would be a mark for me too. <laughs> The worst podcast heel in the game. Let's get to it. TNA this week. I thought they had an entertaining show. Doc did too, but Doc, you want to tell the people how many viewers actually watched it? I think it might just be me and you. <laughs> they, they only did 165,000 viewers. Um, but there was some special stuff between Senior Benjamin and Vanguard 1. Well, it's a, it's their lowest. It's it's one hundred sixty five thousand. That's a fifty percent drop. That's fifty. They lost fifty percent of their audience. Something's wrong with that number. That just doesn't well, seem right. It was on Thanksgiving, and so you got a, a lot of people traveling, a lot of family gatherings, a lot of you know football on. Although that doesn't really wash for me because there's football on every Thursday. But um, that was their lowest uh, viewer total since 2005 on Spike. So, I mean, that's even lower than that Destination America bullshit. But uh, they had uh, they had some Matt Hardy chasing his new dream uh, of Cook being a, a, a chef. And they had Senior Benjamin out on the property looking at some nudie magazines, blurred out. And uh, Vanguard One had a straw and was drinking some booze. So they had a drone drinking booze. So that was fun. And they uh, finally did some work and got Matt Hardy broken again. The seven deities shot him with lightning, so he's broken Matt Hardy again. The seven deities. Yeah. Wow. Why? 
Well, that's how he ended up. That's how Matt Hardy came to be in existence. He was okay. a yeah. He was a part of the, the seven de- deities. It's a long story. We won't we won't get into it on this episode. But it was great. It was, it was entertaining. Okay. <laughs> Uh, uh, also, uh, Eli Drake lost to EC3, so he can't talk for a year or till the end of the year. They weren't real clear on that stipulation. So if it was to the end of the year, it wasn't a big deal. If it was for yeah, a year, really. I, I don't know what it's going to be. I don't know why they took the mic out of Eli Drake's hand for a year. That doesn't make much sense to me. Um, and Maria got pie in the face at the Thanksgiving dinner that they had. So, so that entertained you? Yeah. Okay. Let's move on to Bruce Pritchard's TNA Part 2 episode. Doc, did you listen to it? Uh, I did. I, I did, too. I, yeah? I had to. Because um, I'm just mesmerized by TNA. And I know Harper probably didn't listen to it because it, nope. it was three hours long. But anyway, I, wow. found it, I found it interesting because there was something Bruce Pritchard said. There was, there was actually two things. One of them was TNA actually, Bruce pitched to them for them to go overseas for 6 to 12 months at a time in the U.K. and even in Germany because of how well they draw over there. And, Doc, you want to tell the good people what happened with that idea? It went nowhere. (laughs) It got squashed, which, if you remember, we've actually talked about that in the past, saying, hey, why don't they just go over there and shoot some TV? Because while they're there all the time, it's amazing how well they do. But... Yeah. That UK crowd is hot as hell for them. Yes, it very, very much is. Um, and in the – where am I at? The other thing was – and I saw this on Twitter when it was happening. Dixie Carter uh, promoting her old action figure the day that TNA was in peril and possibly going out of business. <laughs> and, and Conrad Thompson was like, what the fuck? Are you that delusional and that absent-minded enough not to realize, hey, my business is on the brink of fucking going away, but you're talking about your goddamn action figure. <laughs> <laughs> so they I, don't know, I found a, that they, great. It was hilarious. They kinda, well, they kind of alluded to this in some way, but I want to make it even scuzzier and dirtier. They had something on the Pritchard podcast about taking a picture or whatever or something with your Dixie action figure. I say if you do some real dirty pics and send them to to Mike, um, we might have to have a prize winner for the dirtiest, nastiest Dixie action figure pic that you can send in. No, thank you. Do not send me anything Dixie Carter related. Send them all. No, you half lodged with her head up up your asshole and just take a picture and send it. Go fuck yourself. No, thank you at all. No, thank you. No, uh uh-uh, uh, ain't happening. Okay. So that was the Bruce Pritchard podcast. Give it a listen. I thought it was pretty entertaining to be honest with you. It was it was it was long and it wasn't as good as the first TNA one that they did, but it's I mean if you're a TNA fan and have been there for a while and just are infatuated by the, the inner workings of the bad business that TNA has done, you might be entertained by it. I don't know. Hey, if you if you get tired of thinking about the rich fucks that run the place where you work and how much they don't give a shit about you, then you can listen to this podcast and listen to the rich fuck Dixie who doesn't give a shit about her employees. Okay, that's real classy. Hey, now, I don't. I hate this fucking. I'm rich, but I'm still nice, but I don't pay my people. Fuck that. that. Yeah, yeah, I I agree. Fuck that shit. That's bullshit. I totally agree. Doc, did you want to give an ROH update or did you? Or do you not have one this week? I watched the show. It was I think there was only two matches. They had uh, Leo Rush wrestled uh, John Jonathan Gresham, which I can't really tell them apart because they're both like five foot one and jump around a lot. Um, but then they had a really good match. It was the uh, the Addiction uh, versus the Briscoe. So I mean, you had Kazarian and Daniels versus the Briscoe brothers. That was a good match. And uh, the Briscoes won it, and they're going on to the pay-per-view to face the Young Bucks for the title. I would assume if the Briscoes win, it might signal that the Young Bucks are uh, going up north to, to uh, Connecticut. I don't know. What do you think about that? Well, I know there's. A, we talked about this during the summertime. There's a bunch of contracts that are coming up due. I don't know if the Bucks are one of them at this point. But I remember when I did look at it back in July, there were a bunch of contracts that were going to be due around the same time. So I mean, it's it would be interesting to see what ends up what ends up happening there. I don't know. It's I mean I have no insight. I, I have no clue if they're leaving. I mean ROH has been adding, but if you think about it though, ROH has been adding a bunch of a bunch of you know teams lately. I mean not just teams but talent lately. 
Um, mm-hmm. Like Vinny Marcellia, TKL Ryan came in, and they're doing that six-man tag thing now with with the, the Kingdom, with Matt Taven, and then Shane Taylor and uh, Keith Lee are, are tagging now. So, I mean, if you think about it, I mean, that's four guys right there that they've added recently. So, I mean, who knows? Maybe they're restocking because they know they're going to lose some people. Uh, well, I, th- I think if you're a ROH and you're not continuously restocking and rebuilding – in preparation for WWE to raid your your closet, then you you are completely mis misrunning your company. Probably, probably. Yeah. Uh, Harper, did you see any of Raw? I didn't see one goddamn second of it. I'm the only one who watched <laughs> that dumb shit. God. I said fuck this shit. I will say this, and I'll give an update, and and then we'll move on to to the classic stuff that we have from the week. But Raw. The ratings, they did 3.11 million viewers, which was actually great for them, as sad as that sounds, coming from years ago when they would do a lot more than that. They stayed over 3 million even for the third hour, which I don't think that's been done in a while. I'll say this again. Owens and Jericho were money yet again. Uh, I did get one message. I got a couple of messages, but this one was the only one that I, I included. So my apologies to others who sent them in because it just – it was raw related, and I knew mostly I was the only one who watched it, uh, start to finish. J- this is funny. J- I think it's pronounced Jarius. This guy's name. He says, "Man, let me tell you something, Padna. Ain't no fucking way that I would allow a writer to write that segment with Lana Rusev and Enzo." Enzo told Rusev that at Thanksgiving dinner, all Lana was thinking about was having herself stuffed by a certified G. <laughs> so he's kind of saying that there's no way that if he's Rusev, he like he lets the writer write that segment. Um, it, let me say this: I know you haven't watched it the last two weeks, Doc, but Enzo has completely gone away from PG. It's PG thirteen to NC seventeen at this point. But that's good. I mean, Great. It, it's it, and it's kind of entertaining that, that what they're doing. Is, I, I've told you that twice. This the, what they're doing right now with Enzo and Rusev and Lana and Big Kaz is entertaining. Okay, I'll have to take your word for it because I'm on week two. Of, <laughs> I didn't watch a second, and I went so far this week as to, uh, to go ahead and uh, unrecord that shit on my DVR so that they don't get credit for the download either. Yo. He's, he's, he's salty, salty Doc. Doc he's salty. Like a big old can of Tony Saturns. <laughs> he's salty. salty ass. He's salty. Here's my other thoughts. Look, we all know I'm a Sasha fan, but I was fine with another title change. I know people are complaining, talking about, oh, they're hot potato in the title. Sasha won the belt again. Look, I like how they did it. They started the match earlier in the night. That went to a countout. Mick Foley comes out and says, hell no, we're not ending this thing like this. You guys are going to have a no DQ match. Uh, They made it a Falls Count Anywhere match in the main event that saw Sasha beat the shit out of Charlotte with a kendo stick. I know Charlotte had to have some serious whelps on her. Just like when she was was together with Bram, huh? Oh, shit. (laughs) You want to tell the people why you just said that? What? Bram? Bram? Bram's been in trouble for domestic violence in the past. Yeah, but did he get in trouble for beating her? No, I don't. I don't know about that. She might have whooped him. That's why I said that. You got to clarify because you just made an accusation that allegedly. Well, no, there's no <laughs> allegedly. He didn't beat her. He didn't. You don't he know did that. not. He, no, according. Oh, I mean, there's nothing on record saying that he did. So anyway. Sasha beat the shit out of Charlotte with a kendo stick. I mean, just laid it into her. It, I mean, Charlotte had to have just bruises all over her. I've been critical of WWE, but there's there's nothing for me to criticize from this week's Raw. I thought they did a good job. Hold on. I, let me backtrack on that. There's one thing for me to criticize. Roman Reigns in a non-title match as the U.S. champion pinned Kevin Owens, who is their universal champion. So is he so, the champion now? Did he unify yeah. the belt? No, no, there's non-title match, so Owens is still the champ. Oh, huh. Yeah. But, hey, they're making progress. They only pinned one of their champions this week. No, they pinned two. Just one of them got the belt. Yeah. What other one? Oh, well, that's what I'm saying. They only pinned one where it was non-title is what I meant. I got you. Yeah, was that the payoff for sticking around for three hours and 15 minutes? (laughs) Was that they pinned a champion and didn't change the belt? Never mind. No, no, the main event was Sasha and Charlotte. Oh, great. Two women. Super. 
<laughs> you sexist bitch. It was good. Come on, man. Sasha won the title. And the bank statement was awesome the way they did it. They did it in the aisle with her, like, bent backwards using the guardrail. It was actually pretty good. I like. Sounds it. safe. It was very safe. Those two work real safe. You're a salty fuck. Fuck you. <laughs> SmackDown, I don't have the ratings as we're recording this, but I will tell you this. AJ Styles, which is uh, Luke Hawks' best friend, and James... <laughs> I'm just kidding. And James Ellsworth, Luke, if you ever listen to this, you know I'm joking. James Ellsworth uh, took a Styles Clash off the metal steps last night, and I thought for sure it was going to crush his skull into the metal steps, but it didn't, and he ended up being fine. But it looked pretty damn nasty. So uh, that's my SmackDown update. Other than that, SmackDown was kind of lame to me this week, and Raw was the better show, my opinion. Now we're going to move on to some good shit here because this is the type of stuff that Harper and Doc and I really, really like. So... Doc, you listen to the Jim Cornette experience pretty much every week. Is that a fair statement? What? Jim Cornette experience. You listen to it every week, right? Uh, sure. You don't listen to Jim Cornette every week. I said sure. What do you want from me? Okay. Hopper, do you listen to Jim Cornette? Uh uh-uh. uh. Okay. Which well, one? Which one does he come on? Well, he used to be on M- Well, he's still on MLW Radio, but, in, but he's now got his own separate feed. It's the Jim Cornette experience. So if you just search the free Cornette, one. Yeah, it's free. All right. I don't, I don't, I don't pay for podcasts, man. Fuck that. Yeah. <laughs> um. So anyway, Jim Cornette, the Jim Cornette experience from November twenty fourth is lots of talk about Thanksgiving and Christmas shows. Now, Doc Harper, we didn't talk about this last week, but to me, that was a magical time. I never attended a holiday show. Because half the time my parents were fighting over who I'd spend the holidays with and the fact that we were drizzling shits type poor. I just, you know, just never got to go. But I do remember the greatness of Mid-South, their Christmas shows, and then Thanksgiving Star Wars in Dallas, and then you had Starcade in Greensboro. Now, Cornette went on to say, uh, Doc, I think you'll find this pretty fascinating. He went on to say that his small promotion, Smoky Mountain Wrestling, in Hazard, Kentucky, in 1992 for Thanksgiving, drew 1,197 people. Well, in 1992, Hazard, Kentucky had a population of 5,489 people. So, so 11, almost 1,200 people were at this show, and there was only 5,500 people in the whole town. By 1994, on Thanksgiving in Knoxville, they did 1,800 people. Um, by this point, 1994, Cornette said there was no other territory besides Memphis, and no one else was really running Thanksgiving at that time. He also goes on to say that Paintsville, Kentucky, did over 700 people the Friday after Thanksgiving in 94. And then I researched it. Paintsville, Kentucky, in 1994, only had a population of 4,473 people. Now, Doc, i got to ask you a question. You got any thoughts on the great holiday shows of the past? And did you happen to attend any of, like, the Star Wars that WCCW would have? Oh, hell no. That My parents weren't... My parents weren't going out of the house on a holiday back then to take me to some wrestling show. Yeah. They hated wrestling. Yeah. God, if I would have fucking asked my dad, hey, let's go watch wrestling. Dude, what, what, what the fuck are you talking about? And, and play, you with, in that, play with all this shit, I, I fucking bought you. <laughs> and, then, and then you get on to, I mean, you, think, you think, all right, we're going to talk, let's bring it back. I mean, go in there and tell your wife Christmas night, you can, y'all are going to wrestling and see what yeah. kind of reaction you get. Um, in today's day and age, yeah, that shit ain't. No, happen. tonight, yeah, we're just go in there and pull a rib on her. Say, you know what? I just want us to have a special Christmas together. I bought us tickets to wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> hey, baby, hope you got your sign made. <laughs> I hope you got your sign made. <laughs> well, let me ask you a question. I know you didn't attend any, and none of us did. I mean. It wasn't even an option, dude. I can't even think. I don't even think I ever even fixed my lips to say, hey, mom, can we go to the Superdome Spectacular in extravaganza for Mid-South tonight? It's Christmas night. I mean, she would have looked at me and slapped the dog shit out of me. But anyway, I mean, but what are your thoughts on the great holiday shows of the past? And to you, Doc, is it just a complete miss? And is it just fucked up that there's no more? Well, I think it was they did something smart back in the day is you got to remember 25 years ago and beyond everything was closed on Thanksgiving and Christmas. Yeah, Cornette, Cornette was saying the only thing open was um was the movie theater and 
Something else. Gas station, Denny's. maybe. Maybe yeah. a gas station, but you better gas up your car before. Yeah. Not all of them. Like, the truck stops and shit on the highway was open, but you're like, your little local, there weren't as many convenience stores. It was more like gas stations, and fuck that, they were closed. Grocery yeah, but stores, fucking forget about it. How telling is that, though, that they had one, almost 1,200 people in 1992 in Hazard, Kentucky, which has a population of, which had a population of 5,489 people at a smoky mountain event. They had 1,200 people in there and about 3,700 teeth. <laughs> Do you have to try to play heel all the time? I don't it's know what not, you're talking about. It's not. But very let me tell fitting. you this. Let me tell you this. I was out on I was out on the roads, uh, on Thanksgiving night driving around, and it was about like seven thirty, and we drove by a mall. That shit was packed. People were already out shopping. See, there's just too many choices for people. Got too many choices to be able to run wrestling. I mean, hell, they can't, you can barely run that shit on a Friday or Saturday night and draw a house. So how are you going to do it on a holiday these days? Can't be yeah. done. No, but I mean, W's. But man, Fritz used to save save some big payoff angles uh, for the for the Thanksgiving and Christmas Star Wars shows and uh, world class. And I'm pretty sure that that's where Gordy slammed the cage on on uh, Carrie's head was at the Christmas one. Um, yeah, you probably are right. I'm, <laughs> I don't want to quote you on that. Well, so probably funny. so the so the hottest spark to to start off the hottest angle in world class history was done at one of these holiday events. So there you well, go. And uh, while you're while you're on that, so on the Jim Cornette experience, they also were talking about uh, Brian Brian Lass, our friend Brian Lass said the Thanksgiving Star Wars in 1983 and Reunion Arena Re- Reunion Arena was sold out in Dallas. Now, the NWA World Champ wasn't even there because he was booked in Greensboro for their card because, you know, you had you had a whole other city doing a whole but big old event. That, that was probably the first arcade with him winning it from Harley Race. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. So the according to Brian, I didn't even remember this, the Thanksgiving Star Wars in 83, the show was headlined by JYD is what he said and then TGBL said I also mentioned that uh well he also mentioned that Kerry defeated Michael Hayes in a loser leaves town match on that card. Now here's my here's the thing I'm going to say about that. That the Reunion Arena and doc you know this cuz you're from here had a capacity of roughly 17,000 people. So when they I used saw, to go, damn when I used to go see uh, Dallas Maverick games there as a kid, I remember they'd always say it in some weird way that it sticks in your head. The capacity for basketball was 17,007. So they drew for fucking wrestling on Thanksgiving night, 17,000 people in 1983. That's crazy, huh? When you think about that shit. <laughs> 17,000 people. So, so, so didn't you tell me that, that – those jokers up in Connecticut are running a pay per view in our here here in Dallas uh, this weekend. Sunday night TLC, the SmackDown SmackDown pay per view is this weekend. So you they'll they'll pack it right. They ain't packing. They see. I guarantee you, there won't be. What's that uh, capacity on the AAC? You know that you're a Mavericks fan. I think it's I think it's closer to twenty. Right, it's closer to twenty. I guarantee you. If they say they have 20,000 people in there, there won't be 20,000 people in there. You don't think no it'll way. sell out? Fuck no. No way. Now watch they sell out just because I said that, though. I don't see it happening, but whatever. Yeah. But but seriously, I'm, I'm guessing back then with the Star Wars, the fans would watch the Cowboys on TV, and then they'd head to the wrestling, and, you know, what a great time it was in Dallas. Just all I was wondering how did they get away with that with with, with the name? Star yeah, Wars. how did they get away? Yeah, how did they get away with using that and not get sued? That's like yeah. having something called you know the Avengers, you know Marvel's Avengers or I something. I don't know. Who knows? Those and it wasn't good. like they were running a spot show down at the BFW. They were right, down right. at the basketball <laughs> arena. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it was called Thanksgiving Star Wars, maybe because it had Thanksgiving in front of it. Ah. Uh, Ain't got a clue, but I mean it's true because Star Wars came out what six years before that. Mm. Good, good question, but who knows? I don't know. All this talk about making fucking America great again. I ain't trying to get into politics. I just want to make wrestling great again. Shit. Oh, fuck America. Where's my wrestling? 
<laughs> Where's my wrestling at? I'll restore you, shitheads. Anyway, I, I just thought that, you know, we really didn't talk about it on Thanksgiving Day, but there was a time and day when you actually did look forward to wrestling on the holidays. And now you just don't do that at all. So it kind of Hey, did you look forward to that Cowboy game on Turkey Day? You can go fuck yourself. Did we, we hear from our... Chip? Did we hear from Chip? Uh, Chip's message to me this week was so violent, I'm just afraid to read it on air. Oh, okay. Whatever, dude. <laughs> I'll think about it. I may read it at the end. But okay. Chip, let me say this. Chip needs to calm down because some of the stuff he's saying could land him in jail. <laughs> What's he saying? He's making death threats. Shit. He was like, okay, I'll just say it, and then we'll leave it at that. Because I don't know where Chip lives. I don't, I don't really have Chip's address, so whatever, Chip. Chip was like, Doc can go fuck himself. If I ever see him, I'm going to kill him. <laughs> he's, making, he's making death threats. Where does he live so, at? Well, uh, I take it he lives up in Pennsylvania because he's a Steelers oh. fan. So first of all, you would have to steal a car and get down here. Yeah. And then he'd have to find me. And then, and here's the big str- if. I bet he could And here's the big you. if. Then he'd get his ass whooped. Uh, okay. Because I know all you people are like, no, nah, he's got that voice that sounds like white people, black people trying to talk <laughs> like white people. Like you think I'm five six and and 150 pounds? Come knock on my door, motherfucker! Shut up, Doc. You're fucking six <laughs> foot one, and you look like a white Steve Urkel, bitch. I mean, you're so full of shit. Jesus Christ! Don't fuck with Doc. There's a reason he got the. There's a reason he's the. Yeah. He's the one with the PhD. Because he's a book fucking nerd. Anyway. <laughs> Okay, Henderson, uh, our friend Henderson, before we get to the top five, he sent us two things. He said, one, hey, guys, uh, another Torch Talk discussion for you, if that's cool. I'm reading my Torch Talk. It's not cool. Shut it down. December 7th, 1996. Wade Killer talks about the ECW mass transit incident with, and I don't know if I'm saying Eric Kulis' name right, but uh, Wade Keller talks about the incident. He says, I assume you all remember this. <clears throat> Most know this story was that Kulis Mass Transit, Transit was a replacement in this match. He teamed with Devon Dudley against the Gangsters, New Jack and Mustafa. Most know that New Jack sliced this guy open. Would any of you let New Jack or anyone else slice your head open, or would you prefer to do it yourself? And wow. overall, what did you make of the incident back then when you heard about it? He cut that think... boy's head damn near clean off. <laughs> yeah, bro. <laughs> he, was, he was like the headless turd. He fucking cut his head off. <laughs> cut his head so bad, man. <laughs> um, Doc has never cut himself, so I'm sure he's not going to let somebody cut him open. Uh, um, Harper, I'm going to assume you're a manager. You've never had to, to oh. make a gimmick. And... But I remember uh, when uh, Carlos and, and uh, Luke had their match. And then Carlos was like, you know, I don't want to do it. And fuck, Luke's like, all right, I'll do it for you. And mm. he's like, his ass open, bro. Every fuck. time I see Carlos, he's like, hey, what's up, man? There it is. Right at his forehead. There's that scar looking at me. Did he really? <laughs> yeah. Fuck that. And you got to yeah. realize, people out there out there listening, Mike, Mike, Mike looks like Abdullah the Butcher's forehead, bro. No, I don't. He's bullshit. You were down there, spill, you were down there spilling hepatitis blood all over the uh, Gulf Coast in the mid to late That's how a guy to St. Bernard. <laughs> uh, I, I, look, um, God bless you, uh, Socorro, for <laughs> allowing Luke. I, I trust Luke. I, I, I wouldn't think he'd try to kill me. He's not going to try to new jack me, but there's no fucking way that – I'm going to allow another man to blade me. I made my own back in the day. I do not look like Abdullah the Butcher. And flat out, I am going to slice my own head because I can control it and I know what what to do. It's not that difficult. So I, I don't know. Yeah, but I, I, never see those weak, I see those weak that. little scars. I see those weak little scars on your forehead, man. You didn't get no real color. Bruh, it don't take much if you hit it right. Yeah, but you but you did you didn't do the right things like take an aspirin or drink a beer beforehand and get the blood That's going. That's bullshit. I used to drink a daiquiri if I knew I was gonna do that beforehand to give right. me some. Well, because to thin my blood, I'd like I'd get oh, a shot right. of yeah, right. Right. yeah. I'd like I'd like. I mean, I wouldn't get pissy drunk. I wouldn't be like the fucking Tommy Rich or something. Ooh. Um, 
well, whatever. I mean, I wouldn't do that, but yeah, I'd, I'd drink a drink a daiquiri with an extra shot, a small one. That way, I'd have some some liquor in me, and and I'd take a I'd take a ass. Are you a t- fucking t- Are you a fucking girl twenty four seven? Why can't you just drink a beer like a normal yeah. person? No, because I didn't. Why? No, because if I did that, I would drink it real quick. I wanted to like drink it slowly. That way, one, I wouldn't be you know buzzing out there, and two. It would enter my bloodstream slowly. If I take a beer, I'm just gonna guzzle that bitch. Right, and you still—if you're a real man, one beer ain't gonna give you a buzz. How many times have you taken a flat back bump, asshole? How many times have I drank a beer? No, no. Answer the question. Hey, and when is the last time you made a blade to cut your own fucking head? I never, but I don't. Shut the fuck up, then. (laughs) Fuck you. How's that sound? So go. anyway, I think we've we've strayed off the topic here. So N- New Jack damn near went to jail for this shit. Well, yeah, but he didn't go to jail because it's I, I don't know, God bless this guy because I think he's dead now. But he is you know, dead. He, yeah, he no, said he, that no, he will. He died. Yeah, he died. Well, if, well, Harper, if somebody if somebody cut your head clean off, you're probably gonna. <laughs> no, die. He, didn't, he didn't die from that incident. He died oh. like a few years later. He had oh, gas. He, he was a big fat. He was a big fat slob, and he had a gastric bypass surgery, and he had complications, and he oh, died. That yeah, sucks. yeah, yeah. He he didn't die from the incident, but but like I remember hearing stories about the blood that came out of that dude's head. New Jack filleted him like a fish. You can watch I don't blame it. Him. It's on YouTube. It's I fucking think. terrible. It may have been on there. I think I saw it at a time, but it just was like terrible. There's no way, dude. I'm not letting somebody take a break. And he lied. He lied to get. He lied to get in the ring. He was 17 years old at the time. Yeah, fuck that. No, nah, I'm not. Mm-mm. No way, no how. And apparently, when they were wheeling him out, this sorry sap was giving the thumbs up to the crowd. Yeah, he did. He did. <laughs> he did. That they said that. So, no, to answer your question, Henderson, I no, I would never let someone do that. I do remember the incident. It was rather grotesque, and I don't fault New Jack. I fault the the guy from allowing someone like New Jack to fucking slice his head open. You put your head in the guillotine, you can't get mad when it gets lopped off. There's Come no on. way. It, it ain't so happening. let me ask you this. See, that's kind of a that's a no. I I, I know I know and I know enough wrestlers to know that. Most wrestlers ain't going to let nobody cut them. But here's the one I want to know about for some, for some real stone-cold workers like you two. What about the guys who used to hide the razor blade in their mouth? Fuck that. <laughs> this, I've, we've had this conversation before, and hell that's, no. That's fucking crazy. I Look, there's a bunch of uh, – man, okay, so I told you, Doc, I used to put it in my wrist and then flip lift the, the tab up from the from that the blade was on lift the tape up, hit my head, put it back on my wrist, tape it back down. That way it was <laughs> on my wrist. You do it like Corny did the ether in Smoky Mountain where he held the ether rag a foot from the can and sprayed it for 25 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. I mean, or I think I told you the first time I did it, I, I was so, like, anxious to get it over with that I powdered out the ring, I was on the floor on the outside, I hit my head, and I and then I f- flung the, the blade <laughs> underneath the ring because I was, like, I was, like, too, like, I, his shit was going on, and I couldn't get it on my wrist, so I was like, I tossed it under there, and I actually found it later that night. But anyway, yeah, I would, I would just tape it back to my wrist. But I have heard stories of guys putting that shit in their mouth, and I don't. There's no way I would ever do that. I, no way. Now Rod, Rod Price, he would tape it to his finger, and push up on the blade, and then just just hit his head, and it would be in his finger. I, I for the life of me. I don't know how he did that because then I would think I'd, you know, make a fist and accidentally cut my own hand open or I couldn't. Uh, no, I wasn't going to do That's that That's where either. Ric Flair kept it, wasn't it? In the tape know. on his fingers. Maybe, but there's no way, man, I was going to do it like that because, fuck, man, that seems like that's just as dangerous. Not as dangerous as I can putting see, it in I can mouth. See our, I can see our download numbers going down now because we're going to have a bunch of our dumbass listeners down there trying to sw- end up swallowing razor blades trying to figure this out. <laughs> I'm not going to say any names, but there was a guy that I met on the Indies, and, and we were talking one time about, do- <laughs> about getting some color, and this dude told me that like when he started training to wrestle – that he went home one time and like had got found some instructions on how to blade, <laughs> and he said he he said he did it a few times in his mirror just in preparation for the first time Jeez. he ever bladed. Right. 
Who was that? I can't say it. I don't want to. Is it someone I know? No, it ain't nobody you know. That sounds like Joe Kane. No, it's not Joe Kane. <laughs> it ain't Joe Kane. But he said he made it. So I was like, I couldn't hold it in because I'm like, this dude's standing in front of a mirror. And I was like, dude, you stood in front of a mirror and you fucking bladed yourself? Yeah. yeah. It's like, really? He goes, yeah, I was just trying to figure out how hard and how deep I had to go. It's like, you stupid son of a bitch. There's no way. Did it work? He found out? I guess he did, but to my knowledge, the guy never had the blade in front of a crowd, so he just, (laughs) like, just, god damn, I just couldn't take it. I just laughed my ass off with it. Anyway, yeah, we kind of went off the rails with that one. Thank you, Henderson. That was a great discussion that we just had about blading. (laughs) Okay. Henderson. Actually, Mike, Mike, the the other day we had this one of those, you know, I told y'all a couple weeks ago we had that, uh, department get together where everybody gets together and does team building mike was threatening to take a flat <laughs> a face first bump into a table and come up gig himself and come up bloody at it just to see what kind of reaction he would get how, <laughs> you know, how awesome the, would that be if in a, one of our corporate meetings <laughs> i took a face bump into a table and, <laughs> and hit the sauce and got my forehead and came up with, like, a mass full of blood. Like, can you imagine the freaking out that people would do? They'd be like, holy shit, call medical. Somebody would have fainted and somebody would have thrown up. That's 100%. (laughs) That's a shoot, brother. Anyway, (laughs) let's get to the next topic so we can get to our top five. So Henderson also sent one in from December the 7th of 1996. It's a torch talk. And this is from a listener of the... Uh, he said a listener. I don't make that doesn't make any sense. I, it would really need to be a reader. But so a reader like wrote into the torch, and the reader said, "I'm having a hard time feeling sorry for Vince McMahon." And this is in '96. Uh, McMahon claims Ted Turner, with pockets deeper than the trenches on Abdullah the Butcher's head, is using his millions to force the WWF out of business. Well, cry me a river, Vince. Hmm, imagine that 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 could go for today, 20 years later. Um, it sounds too much like the same thing that you know Vince did to everyone else, like with Vern, for example, as he expanded and basically shut down the AWA. Um, this guy also goes on to say WCW is you know Vince's claim that WCW is only cashing in on previously established names. Um, well, didn't didn't Vince do the same thing? I mean. Vince didn't create Hogan. Vince didn't create yeah. Savage. He didn't, he didn't create. create yeah, he didn't create Snuka or JYD or none of them. Piper, Andre. I mean, they yeah. were all names before. The they question. Got the, the question really is, who really has he created besides John Cena and The Rock? We've had uh, that discussion a million times off the air, and it's been a very, very uh, far. Exactly. That's exactly what we we'll do. Because you can't even say he created Austin, if you ask me. No, mm-hmm. because no, no. In fact, uh, they shackled Austin, and he had to fight through a bunch of bullshit. Yep, a bunch Chili of bullshit. Chili McFreeze. Chili McFreeze. Jesus Christ. Yeah, so that goes to show you, like, like you know, Vince was, you know, basically crying and well, and you know, saying WCW took all his talent and they couldn't create a star. Well. I mean, look, man, Hogan is not WWE's creation or F's creation. Savage wasn't, you know, Gene Oakland. The Undertaker, the Undertaker is his greatest creation. Yeah, you got to give him credit on that one. Yeah. But how many bad gimmicks did he hand out during that time, too? Fuck. All of them. We went yeah, through them real. a few months back yeah. on the, the bad <laughs> gimmicks. Shit, do we really have to go there? I mean, the... the, the... But, here, but see, here's the point about that. That's what these old rich fuckers do. When they're when they're ruling the world, it's just fair business, business, pal. And when then they start getting their ass kicked, it's unfair, and they start crying and shit. Yep, that's exactly what happens. That's what I always tell you: when the Cowboys are winning, the NFL is a shoot, and when we're losing, man, this shit's a work. The Cowboys have nothing to do with what we're talking about right now. I'm just talking about the difference between reality and a, and a work. Okay. Top five time. Top five time. So here we go. 
Thank you again to at Old Wrestling Pick on Twitter. We are doing the top five Ric Flair feuds and opponents of all time, ranking them from five to one, along with some honorable mentions that don't make it towards the end. Like we always do, I'm going to start off with Doc Turner, and then we'll go to Harper, and then me, and we'll zigzag back through. Before we get started, though, Doc, what did you have to say about the five as we kick this off this week? I expect a lot of overlap. I expect some variance across, you know, who has what at what number. But I have one that I don't know that anybody will have, so we'll see. And then I have a couple that I think are kind of funny. Gotcha. And so let's get things but started. I, but let me let me just say this. As we all know, I'm the bigger Rick, biggest Ric Flair fan on the show, so my list will be correct. Okay, let's get usual. started. Wow. You can go fuck yourself, but give me your number five, Doc. I was going to say my number five was his feud against uh, marriage in general and staying there. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Maybe maybe not a good one as I hear he's about to get married for about the 17th time. Um, My number five is one I don't know that anybody else will have, but I think it it, uh, provided some classic Ric Flair moments. And uh, that is uh, Eric Bischoff at number five. Uh, for those who don't remember, uh, Rick wanted to go um, see his son wrestle in an amateur wrestling deal and uh, ended up getting fired over the deal and suspended. And uh, and then um, Bischoff famously got up in a crowded locker room and said the only two people – with Rick in the room, the only two people in this locker room, the company that's ever drawn money was Roddy Piper and, and Hulk Hogan. Um, which led to Flair cutting some vicious ass promos with the abuse of power and you can't fire me, I quit, and reforming the horsemen and uh, ended up with some head shaving going on and some actual wrestling matches between the two. But it was built off of a real life personal issue. You could tell. I mean, there was one. There was one promo I remember Rick doing, where he got going so much that he bit his tongue and was bleeding in his mouth while he was going because he was so worked up. A yeah. uh, lot of Ric Flair peeling off his clothes because he was getting so worked up at the time. Um, just really, really personal issue that they put in front of the people, and you could feel. The, you know, at what point is he? Is this a work or shoot? So that's always a, a good, uh, a good feud. And so I put uh, Eric Bischoff at number five. Hmm. That's an interesting they, one. I didn't even think about they, it to be honest. And they say, and they say they've buried the hatchet, but boy, I don't know. Well, I mean, they've been you know, they've been on each other's podcasts, I believe, at this point. So yeah, I'm knows. sure they have. It's easy, Doc. It's easy to bury the hatchet when you don't have to be in the same locker room, in the same buildings with those people 300 days a year. If you say so. I'm just saying. I can anyway. hate somebody forever. I can bury the hatchet with people, but if I don't have, that's if I don't have to deal with them. If i got to deal with them, then the hatchet ain't getting buried. Whatever. Harper, you're number five. What you got? Flair versus Bischoff. You're fucking kidding. I got, nah. I got Holy the same crap, thing. man. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, because yeah. because it, cause it, cause it, it was real. Yeah, I I can't argue with y'all on that. It was real. He really fired him. There was no work involved in that, and they hated each other. You damn yeah, because I was looking coin. at something with the it was the top five feuds online, and, and five was him and Hogan. I was like, fuck that shit. That yeah. is to me, to me, I didn't have him versus Hogan, and he's not on my list because. That greatly underperformed expectations for the two biggest names in the sport to get it on. That never paid off like it should have. Well, Fuck no. It, you're right. Two years it, earlier, yeah. Right. They. That's the one to me that they that they. It was royally. They just screwed it up. It just they just messed it up. It. If they would have done it when they should have done it, it maybe would have had some type of payoff. But because you know they. Rick was the NWA guy. Hogan was the the guy from New York and WWF at the time. And it was a match that could never happen because the two people were two different federations. And then they're finally in the same fed and it never happened. So when it finally did happen a few years later in WCW, it was like, eh, y'all missed an opportunity. So it was like that to me, that's the Ric Flair feud that is really not a feud. It's a it was feud. like watching oh. it was like watching old people fuck. This might have been interesting back when they were young and hot, but they're just old and wrinkly now. That's nice. 
<laughs> so basically what you said, it's kind of like watching an 80-year-old 80 80, 80 Sonny get down, is what you're saying. Well, I'd pay to see that. At 80 years it's old? like watching a 40 year old Sonny getting down. <laughs> Octogenarian pussy. Okay, boy. What? That's, well, that, that's not classy. No, it's no, not. It's Straight up. It's, it's very unclassy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my number five. Um, I can tell you Bischoff was not on mine. I did not have it there. Uh, I didn't even think about it, but you know what? You guys do bring up a great point. But I went Flair and Savage, and to me it was because in 92, you know, everybody was talking about Flair and Hogan in the WWF, and that didn't happen. Everyone was begging for it uh, to find out who the true world champion was, I guess you can say. Uh, for For the Southern wrestling folks, to me it was no contest. It was Flair. He was the true world champion world champion not hogan but anyway in 92 flair and savage feuded it somewhat culminated at wrestlemania 8 with uh savage versus versus flair uh, to me it was really really heated it was a, it was a good feud uh, that led up to that wrestlemania 8 match it exceeded anything that ever happened like we were saying a second ago with hogan versus flair even years later to me uh they feuded they also people may not remember this they also feuded a little bit in wcw for the big gold belt WCW world title once Savage jumped to WCW uh, later. Um, is it the best Flair feud? No, but if you go back and watch some of the promos between Flair and Savage, which I did in preparation for this when they feuded in 92, and watch the WrestleMania 8 match, um, tell me that there isn't a nice story being told between Flair and Savage. It's not the best Flair feud and opponent, but definitely top five worthy in my eyes. Uh, I was actually very, very surprised as I watched kind of the promos and stuff from that feud, how good it was. It was really go good. back and go back and watch the lead up to Starcade '96 when Flair wins the title from Savage, and those interviews are awesome too. See, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, it's it just they just they really told a good story, and I mean you can't you, know, you can't downplay it. So that was my number five. All right, my number four. I have Flair versus Sting. Uh, Rick and you know Rick Flair and Sting's first big time fight was the I think it was about a 45 minute draw that was at the first class yeah. Champions in 1988. Uh-huh. Yep. That was an 88. That was 88. That's what I thought. And despite that event going up against WrestleMania 4 that day, to me, that Clash of Champions was actually a better card, better matches uh, that most people remember from that day. It was then free. Things, it was free, too. There you go. <laughs> things progressed like in 89, Sting and Flair uh, became friends. And then I recall Sting joining the Four Horsemen, although it was very briefly. He wasn't there long at all. Then they injure his leg that same night. Sting returns months later, and he basically wins his first NWA World Heavyweight title from Flair at the Great American Bash in 90. And then over the next few years, I think they became enemies and friends a couple more times. But I just think that their feud, again, not not at the top, but I like the way they did it. I, rem- I just kind of remember that story between when Sting joined the Horsemen and – then they injured him and, and broke his leg. Which he I wanted think, a world title shot, and they were like, what are you doing? You're a horseman. You don't get a title shot. Right. Yeah. Which which his leg was legitimately hurt. Man, fuck angle. him. You don't get a title shot if you're a horseman, man. Well, it is what it is. But anyway, that's my number four. Harper, what's your number four? It's uh, Ronnie Garvin Ooh, versus y'all Flair. Bring out, y'all are bringing out some different ones. I got to admit. We, you see, yeah, so you bring about it, the, the the like '90s shit, man. Fuck that. Go to the '80s. <laughs> go go to the go to the real shit, right? Yeah. yeah. That was my number four, man. Cause I just I watched it about like an hour ago. That that uh, Starcade match from uh '87 uh, and the Steel Cage just to kind of uh, refresh my uh, memory. I was like, man, man, this was good shit, man. This Telling was story. Good shit. Yeah, and it's. And I kind of I remember that because he because before that Ronnie Garvin wasn't really I mean he was a big guy but like he wasn't at Flair's level. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like holy shit, he beat Flair, and it started. uh, I think it was a a good uh, feud with with uh, him and Flair. That's true if you think about it, because I I've always always remembered Ronnie Garvin as you know the Hands of Stones. Yeah. But I never, and I mean I know he held other titles, but it, up until that point, you're right. It's like you wouldn't put him on Flair's level, and then you you beat Flair. It's like, whew, well, look what just happened. 
Um, your number four, Doc. This may surprise a few folks, but I'm gonna go Flare Steamboat. That's way too low for that. Yeah. Um, while they had some great matches, um, and there's certainly no denying that their series of matches in '89 were classics. Um, I've n- always thought Steamboat was a great wrestler, but I thought Flair had to to carry a lot of the uh, the the talking him in the building leading up to it. So that's the only reason that they got the uh, nod. Uh, other guys got the nod over Steamboat, and I imagine that you guys are going to talk more in depth about it. So I'll I'll uh, leave some scraps on the table for you guys to, to clean up. Okay, <laughs> Harper, what was your number three? No, nah, it goes to me for number three. You no know, counting, motherfucker. Oh, that's right. You're four. Go ahead. My number three is Flair versus Sting. So on top of the Clash of Champions, they, those two wrestled on the very first Nitro. They wrestled on the very last Nitro. Yeah. They sent it home the right way. Um, I think Flair was incredibly giving to a guy that was so young and green in the ring and really helped educate him and help him get his feet uh, in the late 80s. Uh, I've never been the biggest Sting fan, but I think Sting probably kept Flair relevant for a couple of years past yeah. than he might have been and, and probably you know gave Flair something to do to get him, you know, get this guy ready. Um, and so I think, and I think that the styles were Sting was the new guy. He represented the nineties or the, the gateway to the nineties. Uh, you could say he was kind of the closest thing that, that WCW in that late eighties, early nineties had to a Hogan type character. He was the, the, for the kiddies. Um, and Flair represented the dirt, dirty old man kind of contingent that still <laughs> wanted to, you know, keep it in the territory style. So, uh, you know, I thought those two guys fed off each other well, and Sting, again, wasn't going to talk me into the building, but he had the the the, the charisma to to get the kitties and the little girls wet in the britches. So uh, there you go, Flair and Sting at number three. If you look at it, there's parallels between Harley, I guess, like passing the the NWA title and torch to to Flair, and then. Flair passing it to Sting, kind of in the same. Like, and then later on, parallel. And then later on, Triple H passed it to. Oh fuck! Oh, sorry. why did you? Why? <laughs> why? Because <laughs> you're easily riled up, you no cell bastard. Why? Number three, Hopper, you. Sting versus fucking Flair. That's <laughs> unreal. I knew. Asshole. I mean, we knew. We, we knew they were going to be close, but yeah. Damn. So. Sting- Y'all God got the it. same ones. Harper and I think alike. That's <laughs> scary. We both God. want T-shirt money, and we both yeah. line up our fives, top fives, the same way. The only thing is, he nails more bitches than you because you're married. Oh no. <laughs> I'm gonna plead the fifth. <laughs> oh man. So you got Flair versus Sting. You got anything to add to what we've already said? I, he just said everything. I was like, <laughs> asshole. <laughs> <laughs> oh man okay well i my number three i got flair steamboat everybody talks about the three matches that were televised in 89 but i always remember flair talking about that feud and he always talked about the house shows and how he's like everyone has seen those three that were on tv He's like, they don't realize how much we did, like, non-televised events in the in the classic matches that we've had. I think I've heard Flair even say that there were some of the house show matches that they had that would blow away the three that were on TV. Or that they wouldn't even get going until the 20-minute mark. Right. Yeah. yeah. And then I realized this when I was researching it. Um, not only did they feud over the world title for, but, but about... Back in Mid-Atlantic. Yeah, well, the 10 years earlier, what I was going to say, they lit houses on fire all over the place when they fought for the U.S. championship. Yeah, down in mid-Atlantic, like late 70s, early 80s. Yeah. So there was a lot there. So their feud kind of went on there. And then 10 years later, it picks back up in in 89 with the the series of matches. So it's kind of hard to go against Flair and Steamboat at some point. I mean, they, they really had good stuff. You go back and watch it now, and you're like, man, I'm depressed. Because wrestling's not like this anymore. 
Okay, my number two, and I, I see where this is going, so I, I got a feeling we're we're about to be very similar. Based on who hasn't been named already, so we'll just justify why, and if we miss anything, we'll add to each other's just based on who's left at this point. Although there is one wild card that hasn't been said that could infiltrate the ones and twos that I'm thinking of. But anyway, okay, my number two, I did go with Flair and Harley Race. I never saw Starcade live in 83, but I remember the build-up for the Flair for the Gold, as it was called. And it's hard to believe that that was so long ago, 36, you know, God, it was 30, 33. 33 years ago at this point. Um, it took place November 24th, 1983. I just watched that match back recently, and the, the nostalgia, of old, nostalgia of old school wrestling is great to watch. The, the feud, the build-up for the Flair for the Gold was great. You know, you watch them work in that cage in that dimly lit arena with that canvas that had that NWA that lettering. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, but you know what though? You know what? What was the finish and move in that match? Um, Flair coming off the the second and crossbody and Harley and and pinning him. Yep. And and the ref. Let me tell you, when you watch it. The ref counts so slow. It's unreal. And he doesn't the really ref, that hard. The ref? You mean former NWA World Heavyweight Champion well, Gene Kaninsky, motherfucker. Get your history right, historian. What was his role at that point? Special guest referee. Okay. Say it again. Well, was that last word you said? That's what I thought. So anyway, what would you call it? You said the, the canvas was hepatitis laden or what? <laughs> it was just ridden with – it was just teeming with hepatitis. But doesn't the look of it, like when you watch Starcade 83 and you see that It's dark in the crowd. <laughs> it's dark in the crowd. The, I mean that to me is how wrestling should look. And I'm, t I'm sorry. I don't care if, you don't, if you're worried about disease and stuff. If you're going to go so far as to put a steel cage around the ring, somebody – Preferably, both all combatants need to bleed. I'm sorry. Even the referee? Uh, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Even the timekeeper. I want the, the timekeeper time bleeding. I don't care if it's 2016, 2026, 1983. If we're going to put a cage up, somebody needs to bleed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and there was some bleeding that night. But anyway, to, to go back to it, so – one thing I want to say about the Flair and Harley race feud was, remember, Flair at that point in time – was the young up and comer, and he wasn't the grizzly vet that we all remember him as now. It was Harley who first ended Rick's title, first title run, and I believe Harley put. I think I was uh, looking back, and Harley put a bounty on Rick at one point for someone to take him out. And, and, and uh, Bob Orton, and uh, who was, was it? Slater tried to collect. Well, it, Flair came into some high school gym. I've seen it with like his neck brace on and a baseball bat chasing him. <laughs> <laughs> Wrestling the way it used to be and the way we like it, and it, it well, and that's what led to the payoff, which was Rick versus Harley, Starcade '83, and the Flair for the goal, which Rick won the NWA World Heavyweight Title. So that was my number two, and Doc, I'm sorry, Harper, I'll go to you. My number two was Dusty and Flair. Ooh, what? Nothing. I'm just. Uh, I mean, I, I, I. He was one of the names I was thinking of that was left. Yeah. So, very I, first arcade man. Yeah. Right. No. 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 The first arcade first was player and race. Oh yeah. shit. Okay. Right. Right. There were two. You're thinking of. Yeah, I'm about to say what my one is, but you're thinking of '84 and '85. Okay. The next two after '83. Or Flair and, and Dusty. Right, 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 right. Yeah, that's what I picked, man, because I just... Because their feud didn't just end. It kept going until they... they remember when when they brought in uh, the Kila Koloff? Yes. It was him and Dusty and on it? It, just, yep. it, it, it. it kept going, and the crowd just... They kept biting at it, so... That shit I, went on forever. Yeah, because... Because... It, the crowd didn't want it to end. Nobody so. wanted to end. It wasn't right. like today where you got three hours on Monday and two hours on Tuesday where you can get tired of something. That yeah. shit went on and on and on and on for yeah, years. For like three, I think it went on for like four or five years. It was Did a long time. To, 87 or something like that? Yeah, I mean like. Next know, I, Arcade. 
I was about to say, I don't want to really get into it too deep because obviously I'll give away something here. But, yeah, 84, 85, it went on. And then we'll talk about this in a minute. You had War Games that was born right. from it. It just – that came from the whole Dusty Flair thing with the Horsemen and Rick. And, yeah, it just it went on and on. It was it – yeah. It was the feud of the decade to me, but yeah, I, that's hard. You can't. Go, that was a beautiful feud, obviously. Yeah. It, uh, so, that was my Doc, two. what's your number two? My number two is Flair and Harley Race. Uh, I had a feeling you'd go there. Yeah, Harley passed the torch at that first Starcade, and you know Rick, Rick has said on his DVD, um, which I sleep with, with it under my pillow, um, he said that you know he held the title once. And the jury was still out on whether or not he could be the guy for the extended period of time that the NWA champion used to be. And that mm-hmm. when Harley agreed to put him over again in 83, because Harley was tired, he was starting to get old, um, older, um, <laughs> that that um, it was a real sign and vote of confidence that Rick could be the guy. Uh, Harley won it, the title again for two days back in 84 after that in like a New Zealand, but it wasn't recognized initially by the NWA. So this was really the last time Harley held the title. So it was a real passing of the torch. Harley was that grizzled old. I mean, if you think Rick is the old school, Harley was the old, old school. And Rick's told stories about like Harley would go with them to, to Japan in case any of the Japanese wanted to shoot on Rick and try to take the belt. Harley was the enforcer. So, I mean, Harley was a, I mean, I can just see, you know, I can't, Harley had to probably put down his cigarettes long enough to go wrestle and then come back and start smoking again and like drinking beer and just ma- old school man's man. Think about your grandpa and Harley would probably have a cigarette with him and uh, drink a beer with him. Um, you go back and you look at those matches and there's just it's completely different than what the, the sport looks like today, except people gave a shit. So I don't know what you take out of that. Um I think you said it earlier. We said it a minute ago. When you look at Starcade '83 and you watch that, that's what wrestling's supposed to look. When I, when, if you said, "What does professional wrestling look like?" That's what I close my eyes and I see. So and it uh, sounded you, great too, dude. You, you could just fucking listen to it. it yeah. With the commentary and the crowd reaction, it, it just sounds great, man. So um, I think yeah. you said it earlier, but Harley Race was number two because it was it was he was the guy. We said Sting, you know, he helped Sting get get launched and and, and really established as a as a credible guy. He elevated Ronnie Garvin as well. Harley helped elevate him. So I'm going to say Harley Race at number two. Yeah, it's hard to argue with that, obviously, because I had him at two as well. And you're right, Doc. When you think of wrestling, I I will never forget. Whenever I would watch Mid South, and you know they were in the 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 they they did their TVs in Shreveport, so it was a it was a small venue, but it was still a dimly lit building that they would do their TVs in. But I can never forget whenever you'd watch NWA and we'd we'd watch the Superstation and they'd show the venues that they were you know when when they were not in the studio, they would show clips of stuff from the the, the various arenas. You always had that ring with that yellow NWA lettering, that nasty looking mat, that dimly lit arena with that was packed full of fans that were rowdy and making noise and it was just tremendous television. And that was what wrestling, like you said, looks like. Not the bright lights of the WWE nowadays, which, you know, it's got its place, but let's be honest, it's not what we That think place is in the wrestling. garbage can. So anyway, but uh Number one, Doc. Let's move to your number one. Uh, I got a feeling where we're going here, so make it happen, Doc. Give it to me. If you will, baby. <laughs> yeah, the buddy. Dusty Rhodes. I mean, you, you talk about a feud that produced the Hard Times promo. The, the, it, it produced riots, which, you know, if you listen to the old timers, we think, we think that the 80s was hot. The old timers will tell you the 70s and 60s was when it was super hot. So you're talking about, you know, fighting your way out of the cage, fighting your way back up the aisle, taking 45 minutes to get back to the dressing room kind of shit. 
and it was because both guys I mean we've talked about some hot feuds I mean you talk about the Von Erichs and Freebirds that was hot that was hot you talk about some hot ass feuds but where have you ever had a feud where both guys could talk like those two uh that's a good question <laughs> I didn't even ever even think about that because those two could talk both of them and so and so one in the building and Dusty was a motive in the ring. I mean, he didn't have to do a bunch of shit, but he could have the whole the whole crowd with his charisma eaten out of his hand in the ring. Rick was obviously Rick, and able to to hold up his end. But then leading up to it, both guys could both guys were singularly capable of talking to everybody in the building. Then you get them feeding off each other and trying to be competitive with one another and outdo each other. And they both had egos because you got to think about Dusty broke Rick in the business. Dusty was Rick's idol. But now Rick's the man, and Dusty's got an ego. He don't want to get outdone there. I mean, just all the seeds were there. It birthed the horseman. The horseman became an angle to chase Dusty and hurt him and keep the title. Uh, the two Starcades, the second and third Starcade, you know, they fought the third one, I think, for a million bucks. Uh, was, you know, a million bucks. But um, <laughs> anyway, I, you know, it's just th- those two guys were, were to me, it, you said few to the decade. I think you might have the, the Freebirds and Von Erichs might have something to say about that, but but it could very easily be Flair Dusty for sure. Um, so anyway, I, I'm going to back out a little bit and, and leave a little bit of scraps again on this table for for Mike on the other end. I, and, and since Harper already said Flair and Dusty, I'm kind of interested to see who he's got at number one. So um, yeah, and then I'll, I'll, I'm going to say something about you, you're talking about the talk him into the building, uh, Harper, because I was going to – hold on one second because I do want to mention this. So I was at the 1986 Superdome – I'm sorry, I was at the Jim Crockett Senior Memorial Tag Team Tournament, which was held April 19th of 1986 in the Superdome. And it was a tag team tournament, but there were two singles matches on that card that night. And one of the singles matches was – Flair versus Dusty. And I will never forget, this is an 86, Dusty coming out and the crowd going fucking nuts. And then Flair coming out and the booze that Flair got. Those dudes went a good 30 minutes, I want to say, that night. And it just was kind of hard to explain. You just got this guy who got this heat. And Dusty's in there working, and they're not doing 50 million high spots, but, bruh, the crowd was all into it and going nuts. So I. Just, what about uh, the Batten Twins? They were in that. The Batten Twins. They, they were in that tournament. They were. They the Batten Twins were in that tournament, but they were. They, see, the tournament was so long that they did like an afternoon show and then an evening show. So they did the first round of the tournament, like at like noon or something, and then at seven was the was the the second round and beyond. So like there were things that's crazy. That, uh, yeah. Well, like I'll give you an example. I remember I remember specifically the Batten Twins got eliminated in the in the first round, so I never saw them. The Fabulous Ones were in the first round, so I didn't see them. Um, the Guerreros were, were the one Fabulous of the ones. One, The Fabulous Ones got eliminated. And say that again. They got eliminated. Kern and Lane got in eliminated the, in the first round. First round. First round. They they were eliminated. But uh, so like that goes to show you. Um, another one. Uh. Um, Buddy Landell and Dundee were were eliminated in the first round too. <laughs> uh, Barbarian and I uh, was somebody else got eliminated in the first round. So anyway, they they're like this dude. The card. I'll, let me go through the second round teams that were in it. The Road Warriors versus uh, Wahoo McDaniel and um, I think it was Jay Youngblood, uh, Sam Houston and Nelson Royal. If you remember Nelson Royal against the Midnight Express, this is the second round. Uh, Arn Anderson and Tully Blanchard against the Fantastics. The Sheep Herders against the Rock and Roll Express, second round. Um, the, it's, I'm looking at it online. I just looked up. The Russian team, I can't remember if that was Ivan and, and Nikita. I, I'm sure it was, but it just says Russian What about team. Vladimir? Uh, you know, it wasn't Vladimir. Against uh, Manny Fernandez and uh, Jimmy Boogie Woogie Man Valiant. I remember that match because it was real hot. Um, there was um, Terry Taylor, Steve Dr. Death Williams. Versus uh, Dino Bravo and uh, Rick Martel, but I think Martel and Bravo didn't show up. Terry, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Ronnie uh, Garvin and Magnum TA, Buzz Sawyer and Rick Steiner. 
Uh, Black Bart <laughs> against uh, Tiger Mask and the Giant Baba. Uh, I forget who Garvin's tag team partner was. But that was like the second round of the tournament. So let me tell you this much too, Doc. The Sheep Herders beat the Rock and Roll Express in the second round. That's Tully crazy. And, Tully and Arn lost in the second round to the Fantastics. Well, who and won it? The Road Warriors won it. Oh. Against uh, Ronnie Garvin and Magnum TA, they they fought them in the in the but You know what? That ain't no fifty fifty booking. Somebody's got to get their ass beat. Well, I mean, but you think about those teams. There was a lot of established teams, too. So hey, you know what though? If you know what you're doing, a team can take a loss and still be okay. Well, yeah. and the thing was too, like we we kind of got sidetracked, but you you said a lot, dude. The fabulous ones lost in the first round. Yeah. Hey, man, Bill Dundee for, thanks, and Buddy Landell lost in the first round. Hey, thanks for hijacking uh, Harper's pick. Can we hear that? Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Harper. You're, you're number one. Ric Flair versus Jim Powers. No, I'm just kidding. Dude, that was a scorcher. <laughs> <laughs> that <laughs> I, killed I got, the territory there. I got a Rick and Steamboat. And the reason why I put them first was because I was lucky enough as a kid to see that fucking house show in a Superdome. That went 60 minutes. With those two? Yeah. And I remember sitting there seeing it. I was like, th- and and the guy's going, half an hour left, and, you know, 20 minutes left, 10 minutes, and the crowd's getting louder and louder. And they and, and so they started doing more in the ring, and it came down to the one, two, three, and the time fucking ran out. <laughs> and I was <laughs> thinking, fuck. <laughs> and the crowd was going crazy. And it got into one, two, three, and then burnt. The, the the damn time ran out, and Steamboat didn't win the damn belt. Puppet masters, though. And I remember seeing that as a kid, and I, and that's why I picked that one as the first one. But it's just a shame that that's you know it's gone. Yep. It's gone. Nothing will ever bring that back either. Uh uh-uh. uh But you're right. That was that was. Well, man, so you and can't. That's why. You can't knock. Bag. You can't knock, and that's the thing too. Like for people who put that number one, it's not. I mean, look, you can't knock it. I mean, it was. It's still a great. It was a great feud. And again, it just comes down to your perspective of it. Like you said, you were. You're a little younger than the two of us, so you. Were I a little, saw it, bro. Right. I was. You, yep. I was one of those kids screaming. Yep. <laughs> well, dude, that was me a few years earlier with Flair and Dusty at the Crockett Cup. Seeing that it was just incredible to watch, and that was—I mean, that was a non-televised event. I mean, that was—it was a big event, but it was still a house show. I mean, it wasn't like it was on live TV in yeah. there. Um, I actually still have the VHS from that night, which was which was pretty awesome. I, I tried to put that up on YouTube, and WWE flagged it. No shit. It. Yeah, I did. I loaded it. But what? I, it was on one Saturday about a few months back. I tried to did, Doc. Didn't I tell you about that? No. Yeah, I tried to load the Crockett Cup, the whole thing. And what I did was I loaded it up, got it started. This shit took like four hours to upload to YouTube. And I wasn't doing, I wasn't at my computer the whole time. It just was uploading. And the minute it uploaded, I get a notification in my email. Uh, WWE has claimed copyright of this content. I'm like, well, you stupid fucks. Why don't y'all put it online so people can watch it if you own it, you stupid bastards? <laughs> Man, I mean, like, seriously, they, they dude. Own it. They own it. They own it. They can do what they want with it. They can they wipe can. their ass with it if they want. That's what sucks about it because people want to see that. Like, okay, if I'm t- I'm talking about this right now and our listeners go, man, I want to go back and watch that Crockett Cup, see what it was like, man. Mike just named, Doc just named a bunch of those tag teams. Man, that sounds like that was some cool shit to watch, which it was. And they can't watch it because WWE pulled it when I tried to put it on YouTube. You sorry sacks of shit. Okay, I'm allegedly. Alleged. No, they <laughs> pulled it. Okay, so uh, my number one obviously is Flair and Dusty Rhodes. Here's my thing: in in the '80s, Rick and Dusty fought for what I would call to be the leader of the NWA. I mean, that's how I looked at it. When when I looked at their feud, it was who's the top dude in the NWA, and Rick Flair. I believe he won his first world title against Dusty, and then the feud just, feud just escalated from there. The Harper already talked about it. We got the Starcades from 84 and 85. The thing was, they continued to fight each other 
in singles competition throughout the NWA, and then the feud it like evolved into you know with Flair, and then the Horsemen when they declared war on Dusty and any of Dusty's friends, and this led to the creation of War Games. You know, the War Games match, which had, you know, I think it was Dusty, Nikita, the Road Warriors, and Paul Ellison yeah. up against the Four uh-huh. Horsemen, and J.J. Dillon. And it just was, you know, like Harper was saying, that it was them, but it escalated continuously, and it went on for years. I mean, you had like a four- or five-year span of just these two kicking each other's asses, and I, wrestling's just not like that anymore. It's depressing. Aww. I know, huh? Sorry, Mike. Show me on the doll where it touched you. <laughs> but those <laughs> were our top five. So let me repeat mine. So my five up to one were I had Flair and Savage at five. I had Flair and Sting at four. I had Flair and Steamboat at three. I had Flair and Harley Race at two. And then I had Flair and Dusty at one. Doc, what did you have? Uh, What? Oh, yeah. I had Marriage at six. Um, Bischoff at five. Steamboat at four, Sting at three, Harley at two, and Dusty at one. And I've got some honorable mentions, as you might suspect. And Harper, recap your five real quick. That uh, Bischoff and Flair, five, four is Garvin and and Flair, three is Sting and Flair, two, Dusty and Flair, and uh, one was Steamboat and Flair. Steamboat and Flair, okay. So, I mean, we, we basically, for the most part, had the same, except for I didn't have Bischoff. So, but 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 we did rank them somewhat differently. So, uh, Doc, you mentioned some honorable mentions. Uh, closing time. Uh, sobriety in general. <laughs> Stop no selling my shit. Um, <laughs> here, here, it's, here, because it's lame. But whatever. Shut up. Here's here's one um, that I actually considered putting over Bischoff was Jim Hurd. Oh, just because of how Flair talks about him now. Yeah, and God. Flair, Flair took the world title and left and showed up on another Federation's TV. <laughs> I mean, you, I think we kind of gloss over that historically of how important that was at the time. Yeah. Um, no, can, let me stop you for I, a second because you're right. I will never forget watching WWF one Saturday when yeah. Bobby Heenan – is lifting that belt up, and he goes, the man I got coming here, because Flair hadn't made his TV debut yet, is the man who ho- who owns this belt. And this was before they started blurring it out because of the, the lawsuit mm-hmm. or whatever. So you could see the belt as Heenan's holding it up. And I'm like, I just remember thinking to myself, holy shit, the NWA world champion is going to the WWF because you knew he was the only dude that had that belt. So, yeah, that was some pretty ballsy stuff to do at that point, to take that shit and go to Vince's organization. And pissing yeah. off Jim Hurd, you're right. What Rick said is, he said, I called Vince and said, you want, can I come up? He goes, yeah, do you have the belt? And he goes, yeah, bring that too. <laughs> <laughs> that was his exact words. I remember that, yeah. Um. Yeah, and the, so the only thing that you say holy shit these days about is, God, damn, holy shit, this is taking forever to get through uh, three hours of Raw. Uh, I also had Roddy Piper as a, back in the early, yeah. early days, those two. Um, I had Hogan as an honorable mention uh, for reasons that we, we discussed. And then another one is, because uh, they used to be tag partners, and then they turned on each other, uh, was Greg Valentine. Yeah, I can see that. And then also, uh, Flair had a really 80s feud with Snuka as well in Mid-Atlantic. So just a couple other feuds uh, that that I thought were worthy of mention, but not anywhere near the top five. I had Flair and Vader. He's the one that you mentioned that you missed as an honorable mention. Now, I didn't consider him for a top five. He wasn't like number six, but Flair and, and I had Flair and Vader. That, so that, that Starcade match where he beat Vader, man, I think Harley was the one that said, you're going to have to fight back to Flair, and Flair's actually started actually fighting. That match was awesome. What year was that? I think it was 93. 90. Yeah, something like yeah. I was trying to remember. I'm going to watch it. I'm going to go back and watch it uh, just to – and, you know. They started beat. They started beating the piss out of each other, and Flair's bleeding from the mouth, just, and he's selling it like he's getting his ass kicked, and he's kind of getting his ass kicked, and because it's but, Vader, but, right? But he's, but he's, but he's giving it back too. 
Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I'm gonna. I, I actually, I want to go back and watch that one. That was one that I'm definitely thinking of going back and watching. So, but uh, Harper, did you have any uh, honorable mentions? I had uh, Macho and Flair and uh, and uh, Piper and Flair. Yeah, I, Piper and Flair. You're talking about Mid Atlantic, right, Doc? Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, like the old, old, old shit. Yeah, that stuff's gold, man. Shit. Yeah. All right, everybody. Let me uh, let me get the the other Twitter tweets out there. Other Twitter mentions, I should say. Uh, at Mullet and Morton, your tweet of the week. And Doc kind of popped on this when we were talking about it on Tuesday. No, I didn't pop on anything now that we're number four. What? Ah, oh, shut up. His tweet of the week. I thought it was funny. He said, "I think I'm gonna pass on watching McMahon's horse shit and roll a spliff and get blazed in the rock and roll van while watching Magnum PI." That sounds perfect. That sounds like a great idea. Now, Doc, you will pop on this one because at Holy Moly Oli, which is the Oli Anderson Twitter account, he sent me an interview from 2002 that Ron Wright did. I haven't read it yet, but I know Doc did, and I'm going to be taking a look at it, maybe talking about it on a future show, either this one or the Smoky There's, Mountain show. As we've discussed, as I we were texting back and forth last night, um, there's enough gold in this interview that we could do a whole episode. Well, and and that's why I want to thank Holy Moly Oli for sending it because Ron Wright is a fucking legend and more people need to realize who he is. And go watch Smoky Mountain Wrestling, please, and listen to the Smoky Mountain Wrestling podcast because it is very, very entertaining. It's nowhere near as long as this one. It's about an hour each and every week. And I think if you watch Smoky Mountain and listen along with us, hey, the listeners are telling us it's a, it's a better rated show that's on the BTT network at this point. So there you have it. Um, also, uh, at BTT Podcast, um, Holy Moly Oli said, Did Horner have pictures of Cornette blowing a goat? Maybe Horner owned the goat. Whatever the fuck, he sucks like a Dyson. Because <laughs> mm. Horner's promos are so bad. <laughs> uh, at, <laughs> at Denim Fritz 605 thank you for telling all of your uh, army of followers to come listen to the BTT Podcast. And that Mike and the boys will give them a free gift. I don't know what that free gift is, but sure. I think it's that you'll blow them. At CM About Cepeda. Time. You're always yeah. saying blow me, so. Okay. At CM Cepeda says, uh, uh, we started off our non-PC for sure last week on the show. Well, we sure did. At G187, David Gill on Twitter. Another great Smoky Mountain Wrestling BTT pod. I now get why everyone loves Jim Cornette. David is from the UK, if, in case you're wondering, so he had no access to it. He says it made a fan out of me for for not only Smoky Mountain, but him. So there you go. UK listener, as uh, David always tweets this. I've mentioned it before. Uh, at Thog94 says, long time and probably the longest uh, of our listeners was spot on when he said, surprise, surprise, the champ gets pinned again. As he was referencing KO getting pinned clean by Roman on Monday Night Raw. Uh, Doc, that guy's like still around. One. At James E. Barnett says, prior to Raw starting Monday night, he said this on Twitter, skip the sports entertainment tonight, people. Watch Smoky Mountain Wrestling mm-hmm. and follow it up with, a be- with the beautiful stars from the BTT pod. I tell you, I, let me tell you, let me tell you people something. Mike is already struggling with this. He's already getting the same problem that I had uh, when I first started. And I'm not talking about the crabs. Uh, I'm talking about when I first, <laughs> when I first started, uh, when I first started watching Smoky Mountain the first time is you get into this shit and they get you hooked and you just start binge watching that shit. And Mike's like, man, I want to keep being surprised before, while we do the shows. But I want to see what's ahead, and I'm like, man, tell me about it. I'd, I'd find myself up at 1.30 in the morning watching my eighth episode of the night when I needed to be up in five out, four hours, and uh, just because you get hooked. I mean, this shit's awesome. And so, I mean, we're coming up on our Christmas break. We're talking about busting out a whole bunch of episodes and just getting a good backlog ready to, to release. And uh, Smoky Mountain is the shit. It's like Netflix. It's like binge watching a show on Netflix or something. It is. It's what y'all watch on YouTube? Yeah. I thought I sent you the link. I, I don't know. Did you? Okay, I'll send it. <laughs> a motherfucker. <laughs> Self-employed people, I tell you. He's a wrestler. fucking fam- He's a famous wrestler now for Wildcat Sports, and he's on TV every week, and he's got bitches and hoes, and he's got ring rats over at his house every night in Mama's basement. And <laughs> oh, I send yeah. him links. I send him links to Smoky Mountain Wrestling, and, and he goes, did you send it? Oh, okay. 
But it is, Doc. You're right. It's extremely easy to start binge watching. And at 45 to 50 minutes an episode, you freaking hit the play button. And then you look to the right and you see episode 23 is next. And you're like, fuck, I can't go to bed. I got to watch another episode. And I'll say it again. You can watch three episodes of Smoky Mountain in the same amount of time you can watch Monday Night Raw. Next well, and the, other th- and, the other, and the other thing is, we you're all hot and bothered about it. We ain't even to the good shit yet. I know. That's what's crazy. Ricky Morton hadn't even come into the territory yet. Oh, no. Mm-mm. But let me tell Mm-mm. you something about Wallace Stanfield Lane. Him and Dr. Tom and, and Jim Cornette, that's some good shit. That's some good shit. All right, Monzi805 also said... You'll like this one, Doc. He sent a tweet to at Dr. Tom Pritchard and said, at Dr. Tom Pritchard, would love to hear you on the BTT podcast. At Mike 504 Saints does a great job with his Smoky Mountain podcast and talking about that era of wrestling. You damn right. At Martin Howell 71. Uh, first off, Marty, thank you for all of the Smoky Mountain Wrestling PWI and After Magazine articles you've sent me. Uh, I just want to say I really appreciate it, and we'll be sharing them on the Facebook page as soon as we get to that point in the promotion on our Smoky Mountain shows. Doc, I've sent you some of those articles, man. Aren't those cool? No, it's fun. It's fun, man. I read them. I did pull up my my bifocals to see it, but I, I read them all. Get a bigger phone or tablet, asshole. And then the last shout out at Bobby Blaze seven four four. Go follow Bobby and check out his books on Amazon. Bobby's a great guest, as you heard on part one. We got part two coming up in a second. I can't tell you how cool he was to talk to. I mean, Bobby and I talked for actually close to two hours, so uh, only recording for about an hour. But real good dude, real good guest. Looking forward to bringing him back, and we'll, we'll do it again in the future. Uh, if you haven't already done so, please subscribe to the show. iTunes, Podbean, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, however you get your podcast. Podcast Addict, my preferred way of listening if you're on an Android device. And please, can you give us some five-star reviews? We could use Harper, more. what's wrong? Harper, Harper, what's wrong with these what? motherfuckers? What's wrong with these motherfuckers out here listening that they can't give us five-star reviews? It's you, Because they're Doc. trash. No, it's because <laughs> Doc's a piece of shit, and he tries to... No, nah, I think... Maybe you maybe you need to talk him in the building, bruh. Yeah. Maybe so, man. Maybe so. We'll see. And then follow us on Twitter at BTT underscore podcast. I'm at Mike five oh four Saints. Harper is at A at C J H Hoodat. Although he doesn't check his Twitter as I always say. And then if you want to support the show, go to MikeMills.podbean.com. They got a bunch of links up there. We really would like if you would donate to us so that we can help keep pumping out this great audio for you. Uh, the PayPal donation link is up there. And also is a Pro Wrestling Tea store link at MikeMills.Podbean.com at the very top. There's four designs for you to choose from. And the other way to get there is our Facebook page, Facebook.com forward slash Booking the Territory. Click the Shop Now button. You can get your very own Booking the Territory Pro Wrestling Podcast t-shirt. If you've got top five for us, send them to BookingTheTerritory at gmail.com. And then the last thing, last two things I want to do is... Three things, actually. Check out the Wrestling Palace on Facebook. And if you live in the DFW area, go see them in Traders Village. Shout out to the King of the Mountain podcast. Shout out to the 605 Super Podcast run by the great Brian Last. Doc, real quick, you've heard most of this week's with Jim Cornette. How was it? Very entertaining. I'm telling you what. Stuttering Tommy Rich is, is hilarious. Week in and week out. That Tom Robinson, that guy's got it going on the, the the stuttering Tommy Rich character cracks me up uh, <laughs> to no end. Uh, good job. It pops me too. Him and impressionist Jim Ross. So great job there, guys. And then lastly, shout out to the wrestling podcast about nothing. My friends Mike Crockett and the Kingpin Brian Malonis. You guys do a good job. Yeah, you're Northeastern Vince, you know, apologist, and you like the WWE, but hey, eh, you know what? Whatever. We can't always uh, agree on everything. And then, promo of the week is from Buddy Landau and Smoky Mountain Wrestling. Mm. The promo is before Buddy faced Shawn Michaels in Smoky Mountain Wrestling for the actual WWF Intercontinental title. So, imagine that. You had a co-promotion thing going back then. Uh, Actually, Smoky Mountain Wrestling not only worked with WWF, but WCW at one point. So, it's a great promo. It's going to be at the end after uh, Bobby Blaze and I wrap up part two. And other than that, Doc, did I miss anything? Anything you want to plug? I just, I just want to say, I just want to say, because I, I was the one that uh, I think 
told you about this promo as I was going through Smoky Mountain. There's not a tagline in it. There's not a catchphrase in it. There's not a saying in it. And it is one of the best promos that you will ever hear. It is fantastic. It's personal. Buddy Landale starts to turn himself uh, babyface in this promo, and it is fucking well, I've seen that. Yeah. I know um, exactly what you're talking about. It's great. He's like yeah. telling... Well, part of it about is all his problems and all that. He's telling yep. right. He's telling the truth yeah. too. Right. Like I mean, there's it's 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 real. Yeah. So you can really get invested in it because you know it was true. I mean, that that's what again that's what made wrestling great back then. There was some truth in the promos. Well, anything else, Doc? Before we get out of here. Nah, bro. All right, man. Well, I thought so. Hopper, you got anything? Nope. Yeah, because we're still over a month away, right? January yeah. 7th? January 7th, yep. Grace King High School. And the names on the card, um, you, uh, uh, Stevie, Stevie Richards is on it. Did I see it, Rhett Titus from Ring of Honor is on it too? I couldn't tell you. Okay, I, I thought I saw his picture on the on the poster, but I, I could be wrong. Harper just shows up 10 minutes before bell time and says, who's fighting tonight and how do you want me to call Dude, this? From the, he from... gets so nervous on – card on on the nights of shows the first time the first time i went to a show after harper had become a part of btt was last january was this past january and so i'm like harper you want to do an interview man nah bro I, i'm trying to get all my shit together in my head for the night man i i, I can't i can't oh, we can't do the interview tonight. and by inter- you said you were like you want to do an interview by by interview you mean eight ball yeah <laughs> No, oh, like I wanted to like get his backstory because we hadn't done that yet on the show, and I was like, "All right, I'm here. I got my recorder." I gotta get my me. shit straight, man. Bro, it's gotta he be was, perfect. He was nervous. Luke made him go pick up pizza and shit for the locker room. He's like, "Fuck, I gotta go pick up this goddamn pizza and shit." Don't, God doesn't Luke it. know? Doesn't Luke know that they deliver pizzas these days? I don't know yeah. what happened, but he had to go pick up pizza. <laughs> he had to go pick up pizza. He's like, bro, I'm trying to get my story. To, I got, I, I'm trying to get my shit together. I got my lines in my head, and anyway, <laughs> Harper was fucking nervous. Anyway, so we'll get more information out about the card as we get closer. But anyway, that's all we got. It's time for part two with Bobby Blaze, and then do not forget we got the promo of the week at the end of this week's episode. Uh, once I wrap up with Buddy Land, with, with Buddy, with <laughs> Bobby Blaze. Once I wrap up with Bobby Blaze, I got the uh, promo with uh, Buddy Landell. So Harper, hit the tagline and get us out of here. Fuck it, bitch. Uh, so uh, real quick, some maybe uh, we already we already kind of covered a couple of these uh, guys, but uh, if I were to tell you uh, one word associations or a sentence or two about these uh, these guys, I'll list them. And tell me what you think. Um, again, we've we've touched on two of these, so I'll start with Ron Wright. If there was one thing you'd have to say about how, how him, just in general, legend. I didn't yeah. realize at the time, but just I would have used the word. Uh, I think the words legend and icon is thrown around way too much in the business nowadays. But looking back, Ron Wright, legend. Yeah, uh, Tracy Smothers. We haven't talked much about him, but thoughts on him? Uh, Wild eye Southern boy, great guy. Just one of the guys that just. Um, uh, love the business, works his ass off in the business, and uh, just uh, overall great guy. Yeah, he's and he's still working. <laughs> he's yeah, still, oh yeah, he, he's still at it. Were you were you there when um when the gangsters were there? Yes, I was there when they came in, and and they actually worked uh, uh several towns for me on the, on this end of it. Uh, uh, up here they worked my hometown. Me and the Heavenly Bodies uh, wrestled them in a the main event here. Uh, and I wrestled them up in uh, Spencer, West Virginia, another town I ran, and, and worked with them up in uh, uh, another town I ran was uh, an hour from here. Uh, so I worked with them quite a bit um, just on these uh, non-TV tapings, you know. Right. I was there the very first time D'Lo showed up. Um, at a uh, We had a big fall festival show we did every year, and he showed up for like probably his first night. Uh, was was he come to that town after he drove from like all the way from Jersey to Knoxville and then turned around and drove like another four hours back to the town we needed to be in where I was again about an hour from my house but um, yeah uh, when New Jack and Mustafa came in and then I remember uh, I was way down in North Carolina and New Jack had already left and uh, Mustafa and I had a wrestling uh, we did uh, we did an opening match three days in a row down in North Carolina. Uh, in a singles match, and mm-hmm. he was a hell of a worker, actually. Laid back as can be. 
Jack was high strung, but there was two <laughs> sides of Jack, and um, uh, the side I always saw, you know, he 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 knew how to differentiate between the two, and um, uh, I worked, I saw him work the night before in Knoxville, do his deal there, and then the next day we were in my hometown, and and he come up here and worked a whole different style for me up here, you know, so um, I was there and I was there, and. Um, uh, saw him from the beginning, middle to end, you know, one of those kind of things, and and I'd have had a problem with any of them, uh, personally or professionally. Yeah, I, I mean, I've heard uh, nothing bad. I've, I've, uh, I, I don't know if you know Rod Price. Rod Price is a good friend of mine. And I heard you that. I remember him. I didn't ever meet him, but I knew he was very respected. And I, I meant, to, I heard you say it on another podcast or your podcast, mentioning it to another person you was interviewing. Yeah. And, I think that's great, man. Um, well, Rod, Rod has told me. Rod, I mean, Rod worked with him in ECW, and and uh, so I, I talked to Rod. Rod, Rod said, he never, I mean, he's never really said anything bad about him. Um, I had heard that he had two sides, but I asked you about that because uh, we've had plenty of discussions. We had a discussion with Brian Lass about the time when the gangsters were in Smoky Mountain, and and man, I, I've seen. I haven't watched the full episodes, but I've seen clips of when they were there and. Oh my God! Did they? <laughs> I, I I can't get past the, the the captions on the bottom of the TV. You know, Smoky Mountain does not approve this message. <laughs> yeah. I think that's great more than anything. So, uh, but no, I was just curious. I wasn't sure if you were there when they were there. I mean, uh, so yeah, yeah. That, that was why. That's why I wanted to know that. But uh, sure, sure. Was. And and you know, some of the stuff, man. You know, you talk about that uh, being entertaining. Uh, Twenty years later, when you're talking about so many angles with Ron Wright and and then the the TV title and things like that. Think about this, man. Um, they're putting the caption on the bottom screen, but think about what some of the stuff the gangster was saying back then and <laughs> fast forward that 20 years. I don't know if anyone could do that nowadays. You could. You, well, Doc I, and I, I have talked know, about that. Or could you not? I don't know. No, Doc and I have talked about that. Actually, on, uh, on not on the Smoky Mountain show, on this show, yeah. we've talked about how you couldn't do that now. They couldn't do that. Okay. So you're so you're agree with me. You probably could not do that. Oh my God, they would. Uh, I okay. mean, can you imagine? Can you imagine Vince McMahon trying to pull that off on USA Network on a Monday Monday night or Tuesday? No, <laughs> no I, I can't, and, and, I, and I wouldn't want it. The, right. The, uh, in today's society, and I know we're all like a bunch of politically correct pussies, uh, or supposed to be. I'm not, right. but. But when it comes to something like that, dealing with race and, and uh, uh, loving one another, man, I'm all about that. I, I, I have uh, no time for bigots or racists or, you know, I man, I, I grew up in a rough neighborhood and I know what it's like uh, on, uh, from my perspective. And, I, and I, 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 when you asked that question, I sat there going, my God, it would, I had forgotten they put the captions on the bottom. And I'm thinking, you'd be a fool to try to do anything like that nowadays. But that's just 20 years ago. Right. Um and you think about, you know, go back to the 50s and 60s, all the stuff, uh, all through the years. And then you go back to, like you say, 96 maybe. And uh, them guys are out there saying some of the stuff they said. You just couldn't do it. And I, I understand it's a work, but my God, uh, can you imagine? Uh, fuck, they had shut down a TV station probably. I, uh, I, I think they would. I mean, they're... Yeah. <laughs> And I wouldn't want that anyway. I, right. today, you know, like I said, I'm not trying to pussyfy anyone uh, or knock anyone in society. I'm just saying, you know what? It, uh, the way I am, I, I would, I, I really wouldn't want to see that as entertainment for me. Um, it, even though they can say what they want to uh, and their free, freedom of speech to do so, I would hope that if if an angle like that was done today, it'd be done in a lot of different taste for today's times, not like it was just. Uh, Sadly, just as as shortly as twenty years ago. Yeah, I but, mean, you, if you tried to do an angle like that now, you, you get booted off of television, or there'd, there'd be some severe backlash. You, you definitely absolutely. couldn't, you definitely couldn't pull it off. So, but uh, no, I was curious more than anything. Um, uh, what was uh, what about Dr. Tom Pritchard uh, in Smoky Mountain? Like any t- in one word association, or, or I'm not even sure if you knew him, but uh, yes, first class person. Uh, I worked in my first loop. And um, I did three days after my tryout. I did three days with them. Uh, Robert Gibson had gotten hurt, and Tom Pritchard uh, would come and work the opening match with me, and then go back out and work the main event with uh, uh, with uh, um, excuse me Bobby Eaton, and then they would work uh, Ricky Morton and Tim Horner stepped up. So I, I come in and done opening match, and three nights in a row I got to work with Tom. And from the very first time I met him in a locker room to the last time I was talked to him in person, 
first class act, man. Good, good hearted dude. Good hearted dude. And loves wrestling. Yeah, I was listening to him on the same episode that you did with Brian on the the great Brian last. Let me get it right. Yeah. On the 605. And I could listen to Dr. Tom all day, man. He's, he's just, he's awesome thought, to listen to. I thought his interview on there was fantastic. Yeah. And just, it, I, I loved it. I, that, that up to the point when I had talked to Brian, I told him, I said, that was the best interview I'd heard on your show, man, as far as how he does those interview segments at the end. And, and Tom just, man, he's, full of knowledge and wisdom and, and just a good hearted guy laid mm-hmm. back, you, but, but first class treats you completely professional man. And with respect. Yeah. We, we were talking, we're only a couple of episodes in to when him and Stan Lane made their appearance in Smoky mountain and, and made their debut. And man, those two guys come in and you just, they, they're stars there. You see it. It's, you know, like the, the cameras on them, they're cutting great promos and, just in the ring, and I mean, you look at those two guys, Stan Lane and Dr. Tom, and you're like, holy moly, man, these guys are great. It's just, yeah. so, yeah, I got a lot of respect for, for, for him and, and the, well, Stan Lane, too, but Dr. Tom, man, he's he's, he's fabulous. Good good guy. Oh, la- last guy. <laughs> I've been critical of this guy on our show. It, it's not critical of him wrestling. I think he's a great wrestler. <laughs> um, uh, Tim Horner. <laughs> uh, what was What was Tim Horner like? Tim Horner, um, to me, he treated with nothing but respect. He was okay. one of the ones when, when Cornette started to bring me in, uh, he was still with the office at the time. He, him and Cornette and Sandy Scott were basically the office. Right. And um, I actually uh, worked with him and got along fine with Tim. Um, I had no problem with him whatsoever. And we did a three-day loop where, uh, I know it sounds fa- crazy, I've done these three-day loops with everyone, but we worked uh, up in West Virginia and had baby face, birth baby face. Uh, it was like four, you couldn't get by this nowadays. You had four matches and a battle royal, and him and I would go out and do the first match and do 15 minutes straight through. And um, anyway, when they put that junior heavyweight title on me, uh, which you'll get to again. I'm not trying to give away. No, no, you're good. Your program. Yeah, but anyway, yeah. he was a. I, I went up and I thanked uh, Sandy and, and Jimmy, of course. And and when I thanked Tim, Tim Horner turned around, and looked at you know he already turned around and looked at me, of course. I shook his hand. And I said, I just want to thank you. He said, Hey, Bobby, I told you, we liked you here. You're a good fit, and uh, this is gonna work out good for you. And um, so I I really I hated seeing him leaving, but I know why he left and when he left. But um, I, I had admired him anyway because I thought he was a really good worker uh, when he wanted to be and when he put him with the right people. Uh, the, thing, the thing is, if, if someone wants to be critical of him, and, and that's one of these things where, um, and, it, and it can happen to anyone, and right. I, I've heard Cornette say this, and that is, uh, and I, my, my trainer, Professor Boris Belenko, he said it about a guy down in Tampa one time, and I kind of say it about Tim, and I don't mean this disrespectfully. There was a guy named Old Henry or something in the ring. We'll just call him Old Henry. And uh, the guy's 5'10 and, you know, 210 pounds or something. A good little worker. But 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 Boris Malenko I was sitting there, and he's talking to Dean Malenko, and he said, look at Old Henry out there. He said, he's wrestling like he's 6'5 and 250 fucking pounds, you know. <laughs> right. Because uh, he, he kind of believed his own stuff, if you will. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and so uh, – Tim, sometimes I think he tried to wrestle a lot bigger or stronger than what he was, and that's not a dig towards Tim because I have a lot of personal uh, and professional respect for him. But I think that if you put him with the right person, you know, I, I saw him have so many tremendous matches when he was with someone like a Brad Armstrong, whether he wrestled against him or tagged with him, uh, or even someone more his size like me or Candido. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he, he could go when he wanted to go. But it had to be, when it was someone bigger, he always tried to be more bigger than what he was. Uh, and, and, and that's one of them things that's, that's psychology-wise. You have to know, like, well, wait a minute here. I'm not wrestling guys my size, so I have to change my style just a little bit, if you will. Yeah. So um, that that's, uh, again, not nothing personal. But um, uh, personally and professionally, we got along just fine and uh, worked several good matches together. And... Um, not a bad word to say about the guy. Just sometimes you got to know when you go to the ring. Uh, this is, you have to change your match a little bit, change your style a little bit. If you're wrestling someone, you know, a lot bigger than you or a lot smaller than you, you know. 
I, I actually, um, I know he left uh, Smoky Mountain. I, I've, I've heard that he left at some point. I don't know the. I won't even ask you uh, I, the, the specifics. It sounds like you know, but I don't want. I don't want to sling dirt anywhere. The um, what I have been critical of when you watch some of the early Smoky Mountains, um, and I, Bobby, his promos in the very early Smoky Mountains. I, I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to be mean. They're, no. they're kind of funny. And they're, they're <laughs> because, because I, I can't explain it. You, you you have to watch it, but it's 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 funny watching Tim promo. And and you know, here's the thing: he's he's promoing, but there's guys like Ron Wright and Dirty White Boy who are promoing too, and and Doctor Tom and Stan Lane and Cornette who are who are knocking it out the park. So right. you know, he's he's promoing not against guys like that, but when you're comparing it in some of the same episodes as guys like that, you're yeah. like, oh man. Well, <laughs> that, that's why I say that. And, and I and I respect that. And I, and I and when you when you hear some of my promos and, and Cornette saying, "Hey, Bobby, here's where you're going. Here's some ideas." And, and Horner had left at that point when 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 some other things happened. If you want to talk about that later on or what have you. But when I start doing more promos, you know, from early on, it's one of those things where you got to realize. And again, it's it, it, you already said it. You, you got guys like Tom or. Or Ron Wright or Jimmy Cornette talking, even Bullet Bob Armstrong as commissioner. Right, forgot him. Yeah, you got to bring your A game, man. And if yeah. you A game, honestly, uh, your A game better be A fucking plus game. Yeah. Because uh, even if Horner had, and I don't even know uh, if he had a B inter- interview, a B grade interview, I'm just saying, when you got them guys, like you said, knocking out of the park. It makes everything else look bad, you know. And, and, and I know and Bobby, that, they're they're knocking it out of the park and so oh, yeah. early and, and I know they're Spirit, killing his it. interviews weren't uh, were a lot like mine in regards sometimes that they weren't, you know, as strong as your best ones were, you're not gonna be on the same level as fucking Cornette and, <laughs> and Armstrong and Wright, you know what I'm saying? So yeah. uh, I can certainly understand where you're coming from on yeah. that. But at that point also realize he's part of the office. Yeah. He's you know, so you got a, a he's part of the buy in, if you will, with with Cornette and with uh, Scott being part of the office. So uh, he had a little bit more free reign back then, too. So with that said, you got to think like, OK, yeah. he's probably getting some more airtime than maybe he should have. I don't know that. But, yeah, but, you know, you can kind of watch and see and you figure it out. You say, well, Reby, Bobby speaking. So read between the lines what he's saying. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but, yeah. I hear you. I know exactly what you're saying, yeah. and I'm not trying to spread dirt either. Yeah. Uh, but but you'll see that with mine. Fuck, I'm going against Buddy Landell. You know, here's my interview trying to be a baby face, wanting to say Landell, you motherfucker. Like 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 I said, <laughs> here he's he's climbing through the ring, and and I'm going, come on, you motherfucker. I'm yelling because of course it's not it's not TV, and we're in my hometown, and, I, and I'm shooting, telling him to get his ass to the ring. Uh, you know, and he knows it. He, he, he like you beat the hell out of me, Bobby. Come on, you know what I'm saying. And I want to say those things, man. You, but as a baby face, I can't. Right. And, on TV, and then he's got that strong fucking promo, Bobby Blaze this and that, talking about my wife and kids and and welfare and whatever. When it goes on, you'll see you're thinking, holy shit, Buddy's knocking <laughs> it out of the park. And then, but but you got to realize it's just part of the yeah. the angle, you know. Yeah. And so uh, sometimes when you got them guys, you're trying to do them against, man. Uh, you you can bring your fucking A game, and it's just not good enough when you got some of those guys like you mentioned. <laughs> yeah, it was. It, you can tell. I mean, it, it just is. I mean, like I said, Ron Wright's hitting it out the park. D- Dirty White Boy's hitting it out the park. Uh, Cornette's hitting it out the park. Doctor Tom's hitting it out the park. Stan Lane is. So you got all these guys, and I mean, I mean, they're crushing it. It's. I mean, yeah. it's really, really good TV. Really, really good promos from these guys, and as we react to it, yeah. So it's hard, you know, when when Tim Horner or even Primetime Brian Lee come in and they're, you know, and and they're they're trying to respond. It's just, it's not. Yeah. It's hard, you know. You're you're grading it. Uh, you're grading it up against, you know, some of the best there there ever was uh, at it. So and I when, agree. And when you see Brian eventually, uh, now Candido, he'll bring his A game. You'll see him, and you'll appreciate it. But even when Brian Lee. Uh, and again, uh, we're kind of putting some things up to when Tammy comes in, uh, you'll see her and she, you know, she's early on young girl Mm -hmm. and you're sitting there going, Oh my gosh, you know, uh, when you're around all them other people knocking out a park like that, Brian Lee, you know, no pun intended. There's a prime example of a guy that, you know, great body could work, uh, 
interviews was pretty good, but they were no level with Cornette or right. Wright or any of them guys. So you're going to see that big difference. And the mm-hmm. same thing when uh, uh, Tammy comes in and tries. It's hard as fuck to keep up with those kind of people. So I, I'm not taking sides because you're rightfully, you're rightfully as a fan and, 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 and doing your podcast and, and what you're seeing and what you're saying, I agree with you 100%. I know what you're saying, and I get it. You're right. <laughs> and I and I tell I say that because um I, I had to say it on one of our episodes. Like, but if Tim Horner is if, if you ever listen to this, I'm not I'm not coming down on you. I'm no. not trying to say I'm I'm not being critical of you. There's actually and I and then I followed up with there's a reason we're doing a, a Smoky Mountain only podcast because we think the promotion was that damn good. Yeah. So. You know, when we say this and we're, we're you know, we got to talk about something, right? We got to talk yeah. about some things we don't like and don't like. It's not, it's not trying to bury anyone. So no, no, I, I don't think that. Tim would take it that way. If he is listening, I don't think he would take it that way. He's not that kind of guy. And uh, if he took it personal, then, then that'd be, that'd be, you know, shame on him because, you know, you're talking about something that fucking happened 20 years ago right. <laughs> and you're putting over a promotion that he was a big part of early on. So uh, if anything, he should take it as a compliment. That you know, his name's out there, the promotions out there, and uh, like you said, you're doing a whole fucking uh, uh, segment, uh, another program on 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 just that you know particular territory and that particular company. So yeah. you know, um, yeah, I, I would I would hope people would take it the right way. If you say, well, fuck that, Bobby didn't give a good interview uh, on this week's uh, show. Uh, when I start, you know, doing some interviews after the White Boy segment, you're going to see why. You're going to say, holy fuck, look who he's going against. You know, yeah. uh, he, he's getting some ideas from Cornette, and, he, and he's getting... Uh, now, he didn't say say this word for word, not like that. He said, here's where you're going, Bobby. Here's some ideas. And when you see it, even on my strongest ones, you're going to be going, <laughs> man, dude, you're on second base. These motherfuckers are hitting home runs, you know? <laughs> and, and, yeah. and, and I accept that fact. So uh, when you get there, and, and you might say, no, Bobby, that is really, really good. And, that, and I hope you do, but but even on my best ones, you're going you're gonna to probably think, well, yeah, I know exactly what Bobby was saying now. You yeah, know, um, and there's a reason for it, and like yeah. I said, because them other guys, and you've already clarified it, they're knocking it out of the fucking park. <laughs> yeah, unreal. I mean, some of the stuff that Cornette does, especially in the early on, is just God. You just look at it, you're like, why can't wrestling be like this now? Why can't oh, we have? Don't you wish that? Well, I mean, we get into the discussion too while we're talking Smoky Mountain of uh, this whole bullshit fucking scripted fucking promos. Uh, How in the flying fuck is a man supposed to think about what he's gonna say? And he's got an idea of who he is as his character, and he and he and he and he. And he do, but a man does not need a promo. Like I could not read a script and then have emotion with it because I'd be thinking too much about this damn script. I can't. I don't know how these guys do it. I, I, it's just stupid. It's beyond me to even think about doing it. And the way you just now worded that to set it up to say what you wanted to say, there's nothing I can say on top of that because you you are 100% correct and it's total fucking bullshit scripted. <laughs> and I, I can't stand it. That's why I very seldom watch today's product. Uh, because of that, man, it's just how to fuck. Like, what did you say, flying fuck? How to flying fuck? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, but here's the thing: it's a multi-million dollar corporation. I know. That does shit, and they're doing something right. But here's the whole deal, man. We're on booking the territory, and I appreciate you having me on. But the the deal is this: uh, BKM or whatever the fuck you want to call that corporation, there. Guess what? We're not their fucking target audience anymore. Yep. You know, we're our audience, our guys, our our familiarity is man. We're with the territories. We're with guys that could fucking work. We're with guys that were they lived their character. They wasn't they wasn't anyone. They, they were themselves. Yeah. When, when someone cut a promo, it was them cutting a promo. They knew what town they was going to be in, who they was wrestling against, what time they was going to the show was going to start. Or, or what have you, and what the reason was, and what the anger or what the fucking issue was. They didn't need someone saying, uh, read this script. Right. You know, so you're, you're, you're spot on, man. 
bottle. I, like, I think I listen. I, I think back to you know listening to Cornette show over the years. Cornette talking about you know they'd be sit, they're in a car going to, going from town to town, and he's like you know they just shot some some angle in one town, and they're in a car, and you know you got what six hours to burn because you're in this car ride. He's like man, you know you're sitting there, and you might jot some things down, and some things come to your mind, and and then you're like oh shit, when I get the TV, you know I'm gonna go with this. I don't have a script, but I got an idea of what's gonna come out. So yeah. like you, you know, you thought about it and you knew what was going on. Like you just said, Bobby, you go into that town, so you, you you're you're automatically thinking, and it's gonna go back to the whole thing. You know, you're talking them into the building eventually too, because you yes. know what's coming up at TV. But oh man, but Bobby, yeah, that was that was some good stuff. Well, Bobby, hey, before I let you get out of here, man, I want you to uh, go ahead and plug your books because I know you got I know you got the books. I I, I want to say this before you plug the books. You, the book, pin me, pay me. Yes. When I tell you, my buddy Doc Turner that does the Smoky Mountain show and the Book in the Territory show with me, uh, we work together actually at our full time jobs. I can't tell you how many times we say to each other when it comes to something at work where it's just like, well, whatever. You want me to do that, boss? Sounds good. I <laughs> cannot tell you how often we go, pin me, pay me. <laughs> there you go. We say that to each other. <laughs> <laughs> it's a shoot, man. Yeah. It, it, it is. It's just been me paying, man. I, I go to, I'll get my boost. I'll go to the next fucking town, boss. You know, that's no big deal. Uh, cause you, you gotta, if not, man, you got a hard fucking life. If one of those things, when a kid comes home from kindergarten the first day and talks about what a hard fucking day it had, you know what, pal? Your life is going to get a whole hell of a lot worse as you get older. <laughs> so it's one of those things you got to take an attitude of, man, I don't have a good attitude and look at the guy and say, hey, pin me, pay me, man. I, you know, uh, that, that's that's right. great. I love that you guys do that. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so my first book was Pin Me, Pay Me, Have Boothful Travel. Uh, both my books are available on Amazon. My second book, which just came out last, uh, well, earlier this month, I, I should say. I said last month. Um, it's called I Kicked Out on Two, The Education of a Wrestler. Um, I talk about everything from, uh, you know, breaking into the business to uh, to working out first time with Landell, all the way through the uh, whole Smoky Mountain spew with the uh, junior title, the TV title, through the heavyweight title. Um, I talk about being, about being in WCW, talk about briefly, uh you know, some time that I had done some TVs uh, way back in the day with uh, WWF, um, places I've been, South Africa, Canada, Australia, uh, England, and then five tours of Japan. And so, uh, yeah, uh, I talk about, uh, honestly, uh, the second book takes a little bit more perspective on life outside the ring. Uh, I start off with uh, 50 Shades of Blaze because, uh, you know, there's a lot of whores and sluts and rats and <laughs> all that out there. And, and as you get a little bit older and you're not in a limelight, you know, sometimes that free pussy is a little bit harder to get by. And, uh, <laughs> and I'll tell you this, and you probably know this, man, there's no such thing as free pussy. You always have to pay the rent, man. So it's, <laughs> I, I take that, you know, it's one of those things, whether you're married or single, uh, whether you just date on the side or whatever your deal is, one way or the other, you always got to fucking pay the rent. So oh, yeah. Free pussy. But, but it is nice when it's out there waiting for you. The ring rats are whatever, and it comes a little bit easier. So I talk <laughs> about that all the way through, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier. I respectfully uh, list most of the guys that have sadly passed away in the last few years. Um, and I do it. I use their ring names. I do it in a professional manner in a way that I don't talk about it, you know, any how, how they died, whether it be just, you know, from – from old age or from any other, you know, I, I, I put them over as to how they treated me and how I was with them and, and tell those kind of stories. And I just talk about life in general. Um, I have a degree in communications and, and I don't say it bragging and boasting. I, I just, I, I obviously can, can speak or, or talk and communicate with people. And, and I just found uh, the writing these things down because people want to hear my stories. So you can go to Amazon. If you just go to Google and type in "pin me, pay me," it'll pop up one of the first things. Uh, I kicked out on two, same thing. Or go to Amazon and type those in. Uh, you can get a hold of me on Twitter at Bobby Blaze 744. And yeah, I follow Booking the Territory. Um, and I'm also on Facebook as Bobby Blaze with a fan page. And there's Bobby Blaze Smedley. And, and when you when you hit me up. If you're out there listening, let, let them know. Say, hey, I heard you on Booking the Territory, man. And if you want to buy a book, uh, I appreciate it. If you don't, you know what? That's cool, too, man. It's all good, cool in the game with me because, uh, you know, I'm not trying to get rich. I'm not trying to make the New York Times bestseller list. 
I just enjoy professional wrestling the way it used to be, the way it should be, the way it should be when you're booking the fucking territories, man. <laughs> <laughs> hey, there you go, Bobby. Hey, Bobby, while you talk, you, I started thinking about something while you were talking about ring rats. So uh, uh, this this guy, whoever he is, at Mullet and Morton on Twitter, he he's got a, he's got a great hashtag. Yeah, it seems like it seems like it's catching on. Um, it's it's hashtag all rats matter. So I do need to ask you, Bobby, do all rats matter? <laughs> oh, man. Uh, I will politely say all rats matter just so so the, the uh, Muller of Morton there, he can say, hey, did you hear me on? Did you hear Bobby Blaze put over my hashtag uh, <laughs> along on on the uh, on booking the territory? And, and, you, and you mentioned it. They can say Mike mentioned it. So, you know, hey, we're, we're getting it over because it is catching on. But, you know. <laughs> Uh, hey, I don't care if you're skinny, heavy, <laughs> fat, white, black, whatever. Um, you know, it, it all rats matter because they all serve a purpose. So, uh, yeah, let's go ahead and put them over because uh, they all need loving too. And so, uh, yeah, we'll just keep the hashtag going, all rats matter, man. That guy tweets me, that guy tweets me nonstop. Oh man, it's funny. Me too, and I, and I, I love it because whoever it is, is is doing a hell of a job with that man. And, uh, he's tweeting you know, me nonstop. I was like, hey, he's funny though, man. He he always yeah, tweets. Yeah, his, yeah. And it's, he all, to, it's all in play. Yeah, you got to take it the right way, man. Everything is just like you said, pin me, pay me, boss. You, know, <laughs> you got to take some things. Uh, you know, we, on that there. When, when he puts that stuff out there, you just got to take it with a grain of salt, and, and it's all meant in good, clean fun. And well, maybe not so clean, but good, good fun. <laughs> right, right. And, uh, yeah. So, and we have fun with it. That's what I mean. You yeah, know? yeah. I, I, I'm right there with you. Well, uh, well, Bobby, I, I appreciate your time, man, and uh, thank you for doing this again. Um, I'm probably gonna, uh, I'm probably gonna break this up into two parts since we went a little, since we went over an hour. But no, I, I really appreciate you doing this, and I, I'll, I will definitely, if you're interested, I'll have to bring you back uh on the show at some point maybe maybe we'll talk a little bit more smoky mountain once we get into the episodes where you're on and yeah i definitely would want to bring you back on man if you, if you had pleasure. a good time be my pleasure and and i want to tell you thank you very kindly and that is just me being me it's just the way i am uh, you know fuck i am being serious it's 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 my pleasure to be on your show and and wrestling fans you know i can't emphasize enough about the book in the territory and when there was territories and stuff and the people that follow, you know, your, your page and your links and your Twitter and, and follow this podcast, man, it, it, it's the good times of professional wrestling. And I always sign books. And again, I'm not trying to plug it. You gave me my chance to do that. I always put in there, always remember the good times that pro wrestling or always remember the good memories of pro wrestling that you have whenever I sign anything, and I mean that sincerely, and that's what this program does. It, it keeps people going. Um, hell, you know, when people can hear about when, when a, a young person, uh, like we was talking about, having a hard time understanding what it was like when territories were around and stuff, but, man, for guys like us that got to watch them and see it, man, what a, what a great fucking time period in pro wrestling. So thank you for having this podcast, Booking the Territory, and thank you for having me on because it's been my complete pleasure thank you that is going to wrap up part two with former smoky mountain wrestling heavyweight champion bobby blaze if you haven't already done so go check out part one i'm sure you'll enjoy it just as much as you enjoyed part two with bobby blaze and again if you are not listening to our smoky mountain wrestling podcast that comes out every single sunday night please do so we are up to episode i believe it's 13 or 14 this week i can't quite remember off the top of my head but it's really really some good stuff you can follow along with us uh, as we go through and review each and every episode of Smoky Mountain Wrestling, Jim Cornette's promotion from 1992 through 1996. I have to tell you, it's much more entertaining, like I always say, than your current product that's out there. Most of what WWE is putting out that is. So we appreciate you tuning in again this week. And uh, like I said, if you want to help support the show, I mentioned it earlier, please check out our Amazon referral link that's at the top of the page of MikeMills.Podbean.com. We get a little small amount in return every time you use it. So I'd appreciate if you do. It doesn't cost you anything extra. You know, I know a lot of those big name podcasts. I don't want to mention any names and get any heat with the big name boys, but they all do the Amazon referral links they don't need that money trust me 
Whereas the small time guys, the independent guys like me, we could certainly use it. So we'd appreciate if you would use that link if you are shopping on Amazon. Also, again, check out our Pro Wrestling Tees store. You can get there. Again, at the same link, mikemills.podbean.com. At the very top, you'll see the link, Pro Wrestling Tees. And then you'll also see a PayPal donation at the same link, mikemills.podbean.com as well. If you want to just donate to the show a buck or two or, you know, if you got any money. If you don't have money, hey, no problem. The show will be free. It'll always be free. And we appreciate you tuning in to us each and every week on Booking the Territory Pro Wrestling Podcast. Follow us on Twitter at btt underscore podcast i'm at mike 504 saints and again hard body hopper from wildcat sports and entertainment is at cjh who and uh give him a follow even though he doesn't use it too much all right i'm gonna get us over now to this week's promo of the week which is from buddy landell when he was in smoky mountain wrestling as he was about to face Shawn michaels for the wwf intercontinental title in smoky mountain wrestling i think it's a very good promo it's real it's reality it blurs the lines because there's so much just reality in the promo that i think you'll enjoy it so here it is buddy landell and smoky mountain wrestling as he's getting ready to face Shawn michaels for the wwf at the time intercontinental title thanks again everyone for tuning in and we'll catch you either next week on this show or hopefully this coming sunday on our smoky mountain wrestling podcast review show I'm not even going to have to interfere in that match. No, I won't. You won't? No, I won't. Absolutely not. That's right, Jimmy. You're not going to interfere. I'm not? No, you're not. And I'll tell you why. Number one, I'm very glad to hear Shawn Michaels' comments regarding the career of Buddy Landell that he finds so important to remember. But let me give you a brief little autobiography of Buddy Landell. You see, I've spent my whole career saying that I was from here, from there, but the truth is this. I was born and raised in Knoxville, Tennessee. Growing up in Knoxville, Tennessee, I grew up on Ron Wright. I've been a wrestling fan all of my life. And at the tender age of 17, I quit after my football career at Fulton High School my junior year and started a professional wrestling career. And it took me five or six long years to get to the top. But by the time that I was 23 years old, I was wrestling the nature boy Ric Flair for the world heavyweight belt. A lot of people said, that I was to be the next world heavyweight champion. The only problem was this. By that time, I had been introduced to drugs and alcohol. And the truth of the matter is this. I was an alcoholic and I was a drug addict. And I was in denial. Drugs and alcohol cost me that career, a million dollar career. By the 1985, by 1985, I was fired from that position as a national heavyweight champion, the number one contender for the world heavyweight belt. And I've spent these last 10 years aimlessly wandering around professional wrestling like the magazine say a vagabond a gypsy being hired and fired by every promotion being in denial about drugs and alcohol and up till a year ago i had become my own worst enemy i had to look at my wife and my children and my family every day and drive up and down the road where everybody else was flying in jets and limousines i was driving with the nobodies And by this time, drugs and alcohol had taken my life. I'd even thought about suicide. But then I come to a point to where I needed help, and I got down on my knees and I asked God Almighty to help me. And help me, he did. You see, I was tired of looking at myself in the mirror saying, will I ever measure up to what I used to be? And a year ago, I came back into professional wrestling weighing 260 pounds. I defeated my own worst enemy a year ago. That was Buddy Landell. Now, this last year been in professional wrestling, I've lost all my weight. I'm back on top. I've beat everybody in Smoky Mountain Wrestling. I've been up and down since I turned 17. I've been on top and seen my wildest dreams. I've got it back and I'm feeling better every day. And I tell all them pencil pushers to stay out of my way. You know, Chip, A lot of people, this is the big deal about Buddy Landell. I got dozens of friends and the fun never ends. That's as long as I'm buying. When the money ran out, that's when the people left me. Oh, everybody wanted to be on the Buddy Landell bandwagon until the money ran out. God forgave me. My family forgave me. And everybody in Knoxville, Tennessee knows Buddy Landell is a home-cooking, hometown boy. I love Knoxville, Tennessee, and I'm proud of it. But Friday night, August the 4th, Shawn Michaels... 
I'm telling you something, I'm in the best shape of my career. I'm 33 years old. I have held more wrestling titles than the years you are old, son. I'm not taking nothing away from you. Voted the sexiest man in wrestling. That's great. Friday night, August the 4th, brother. Super Bowl of Champions, I want you to come in tip-top shape because I'm promising everybody in my hometown where it all began that I'm going to become the WWF Intercontinental Heavyweight Champion.